Good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Good morning if you're on the West Coast. It's National Signing Day 2017, the most important day that doesn't involve actual football games being played. Uh, I'm Ryan Nanny, hosting this year. Uh, with me, Amy Campbell, Bud Elliott, two of the smartest people we could possibly have to talk about recruiting, which is important <laughs> because as I explained it to them, and now I'll explain it to you, the audience, the way this show is going to work is think of them as elite tennis champions, and I am the chair judge. So if you notice me at all, it probably means that I screwed up or that one of them screamed at me. So that's sort of what we're going to do today. Uh, guys, thank you so much for being here. We, I feel like we should have you in the middle so we can get the, no, the I, tennis I, I, head I, I going wanna, back I and wanna forth. I want to just be, avoid this as much as possible. Um, I want to emphasize that all useful information out of this show is going to come from these two. So if there's some way your computer can just mute me and listen to them, perfect. Um, so let's start out. It's 1 o'clock right now. A lot of guys have already committed and announced so far today. Uh, but what sticks out to you as sort of the interesting stories at this point in signing day? I, you know, I really think it's the offensive tackles that, that are, are elite. But so far this morning, we, we've seen LSU land Tyler Taylor. We've seen them land uh, Caleb on Chase on out, out of Houston, Texas. We saw Auburn get Marcavius Bryant. We saw Alabama get Henry Ruggs. Just a number of elite players going to top SEC programs. The SEC is having a great day so far today. Uh, but also Maryland, which I know we'll talk about later mm -hmm. in the show. Absolutely. Um, Amy, is this a boring signing day? Be honest. Like, you, you've done this a lot. Yeah. You've seen signing days that are crazy, that are tame. Where does this fall sort of in that spectrum? That's a great point. I, I always describe it as the soap opera. Yeah. There's intrigue and heartbreak and um, these major cliffhangers, and you just see these crazy things unfold on signing day. It really all comes to a head. And it, it, so far, it is one of the slower days. I was trying to think of what's the craziest thing we've seen so far today. Perhaps it's Levi Jones putting on three different shirts. Right, but right. In the, in the grand scheme of crazy signing day, nobody's parents have run away with a letter yet. <laughs> um, nobody has faxed letters to multiple schools. So, so far, it actually is pretty quiet. Pretty calm. And Next. no live animal commitments yet. Yeah, in, in I got years. my fingers. I'm hoping, guys. The day Let's... is young, and <laughs> and there's still time to get to a pet shop if you're if you're thinking about it. Um, well, let's talk about why that is. Why do you guys think that signing day as a whole has kind of, in some ways, lost the dramatic luster? I guess is the word for it. I, I think first and foremost, kids are visiting earlier, right? And so they're they're getting a better perception of what programs they like. They're able to. I mean, now I can FaceTime with Nick Saban if I'm an elite recruit, right? Before, I might have to wait. He would hate that, I bet. No, he FaceTimes with Really? Nick, Nick FaceTimes, yes. Oh my God. He does So, it look, <laughs> if it gets a recruit, he does okay. it. Uh, he, he goes to your, your practice on a helicopter. So, I think you're, they're able to, to get that kind of pseudo in-person contact earlier. Uh, and also, a lot of kids, and we wrote about this on SBNation.com. You guys can, can Google this and check out the, the early enrollee piece we did. A lot of kids now are really determined basically at the start of their junior year, hey, I'm going to finish high school a semester early. I want to, I'll skip prom, I'll enroll in January, and I'll be able to work out with the team. I'll be able to go through spring practice with the team. We saw Jalen Hurts do this last year at Alabama. We saw Dexter Lawrence do this last year at Clemson, and they both played a really prominent factor in this, uh, this season we just had. Yeah. Uh Amy, that all sound right to you? Yeah, guys, they're just getting on campus earlier yep. and earlier, and the offers are going out earlier and earlier. Right. I remember it was a huge deal when Dylan Moses was offered as an eighth grader, and that was a huge story, and now that's pretty much the norm, and you have guys with their name out there so much earlier because of social media mm -hmm. and because there's so much stuff on these guys before half the time before they even hit high school. So right. coaches are on them so much earlier. The whole cycle is just more advanced, which is kind of making it a little bit more boring for us. A lot of the top guys are already on campus, so we're not going to see anything too crazy. Yeah, I mean, I guess the plus is that the more these guys get on campus earlier, the more likely they are to contribute earlier in their careers, uh, have more long-lasting contributions. So maybe in the net it's a positive if you're a college football fan, but for just today... Yeah, we do need more moms just absconding yeah. with letters of intent and fax machines mysteriously getting broken. And my favorite is always a uh, guy goes through elaborate commitment announcement, and then you have this weird gap of time where the coaches are like, well, we didn't get a letter. Where's yet. the letter? Yeah. So it's, it's sort of like, to me, it's sort of like you had this very public engagement, but then you're late to the wedding. And everybody's just sort of like, is everything okay? Are you getting left it, at the altar? Is, 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 is it happening? And, and we, we still have cake? We've yet to have like a real hat giveaway. Normally, right. folks, if you're watching at home, if you're watching one of these commitment ceremonies, 
if the one kid has a hat that's super nice and looks like he's been maybe wearing it in, getting the right curve, maybe it's the one he wants to take his photos in, right. and the other three looks like he just picked them up on the gas station on the way to the commitment ceremony or on the way to school that morning, that's a good hint. He's probably not going to want to take photos in the hat that looks like trash. So, so far, everybody's had quality hats for all their teams. It's some real nice disguises going on. So, but why don't, if I'm a recruit, why am I not sort of steering into that and faking you out with one really like worn hat that looks like it's ready but really i'm using one of the gas station hats. it's pretty meta i mean oh. I, I i think you really have to to be sort of so into that recruiting culture i don't know if the recruits even realize that we know oh yeah that, so that, they so that is but that's, they will that's, that's the, next you, yeah. that's the next that's they're gonna next. watch this show that's yeah. the next career in the recruiting industry is you know there are plenty of people out there who can scout and sort of tell you where a guy looks like he's going to project we need people who are willing to go out there and say i can take your commitment <laughs> to the next level. We can confuse people, throw them off, smoke signals, everything. Well, That's it's it's becoming almost an art to come up with the most interesting creative yeah. and like best fake out ways to commit. So How long how long will it be until a recruit commits from space? Oh gosh! Well, we had one from Paris right? today, right. so yeah. I feel like it can't be that long. Uh, I, ooh, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a really good See, question. See, somebody's thinking it right now. Somebody's out there working somebody's on it. Somebody's out there right working now. on this. Ooh, scuba could be next. I'm trying to think. We've, had, we've had a guy skydiving. Yeah. We've had the, the weather balloon up into space. We've had from Paris and sure. creating the Eiffel Tower into the Alabama A, which yes. is... I can already <laughs> picture it. The guy, you know, he dives into the water with the scuba tank, opens up sort of like a submerged treasure, treasure chest. chest. The yes. light shines yep. onto his face. Yep. Like, why is... Why is there an Auburn hat and a treasure chest? That seems <laughs> unnecessary. But yeah, that's exactly how the... We're just predicting the future for you here. You're welcome. You're um, welcome. So we're going to talk to several of our team bloggers today. We're going to talk about a bunch of different teams, who's doing well, who's doing not. But just from a very, like, panic, don't panic perspective, which team... Amy, I want you to give me one team that you think should be feeling good right now and okay. one team that you think should be a little bit worried. Well, I think USC should be feeling great, especially because they've already had a really, really big day. They've picked up a lot of players already this morning, and they are going to be adding several more later today. I think there's a lot left out there for them, especially as we see this kind of every year. They rocket up the rankings because they're out there on the West Coast. Yep. Uh, I think Florida is doing all right, but I, I still – people <sighs> want to say that maybe they're doing pretty well because they are adding some guys today. Right. but. In perspective, yeah, th that feels like it's more. Oh, it's not the doom and gloom that we thought. Congrats, it was going you're to not be. doing as bad as we right. thought. It's sort of like <laughs> finding out that your house has some water damage, but not as much as you <laughs> thought it did. Exactly. So right. I, I'm a little worried about Florida. Okay, uh, Bud, how about you? One team that should be feeling good. One team that should not. You know, uh, Alabama uh, should probably feel okay. Looks like they <laughs> may have just gotten a top 100 player nationally to take a gray shirt. They have, what, five, five stars, 16, four stars. It's just ridiculous at this point. It's probably their best class ever. Uh, looks like we are not even had lunch yet, and they've locked up the number one class. I mean, Najee Harris, arguably the number one running back. Alex Leatherwood, the number one player in Florida. Dylan Moses, if you want to count him as a Louisiana player, he was there at the IMG Academy, but the number one player in Louisiana, arguably. Jerry Judy, a, a guy who, uh, just an, an elite receiver, I think, can play early. And then they get the number one player out of Hawaii, uh, to a Tagovailoa, who you know, say that a couple times. <laughs> you handled it fine, though. I've, I've done it. You practiced. Yeah. I can tell. Well, um, and I think Alabama's ability to reload is is absolutely amazing. But what is kind of hilarious to me is that all of their running backs look exactly the same. Sure, if you start sure. thinking they, about they it, like, like they're clothes of each other. Sort of Alabama like yes. going back to Trent Richardson, yep. to Eddie Lacy, Derrick Henry, Bo Scarborough, yep. and now Najee Harris. These guys are like clones of each other. Yep. It's so fascinating. Like, are you six foot two, two and a quarter dreads? Dreads. Uh, and, and four or five or less? Because yeah. like, yep. that's the only type of running back. Yeah. Yeah. That one. I'm sorry. Fill them in. Uh, but what about one team that should not be feeling so good? Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to talk about this later in the show, but Ole Miss, because of, of the NCAA cloud, uh, has, that's really kind of put a damper uh, on some of their expectations. I, I know Ohio State was trying to get in for Jay Tufele, but they, their class is really awesome. Uh, you know, Florida State is signing a great class. They haven't had a great close so far. We'll see what happens with Marvin Wilson at 430 today. I don't think there's another team we really pinpoint that's having a, a, a bad day. You're having a couple teams that are having really good days. I think Amy's USC is probably the surprise of the day. Why is that? I mean, just because, you know, from a super detached perspective, it's it's USC. And, yeah, there were the down years where they had the scholarship restrictions. But w why is it surprising, I guess, that they are doing as well as they are? Even when USC was, having, was struggling with, with sanctions and with probably poor coaching, right, 
Kitt still wanted to go to USC. Now that USC just won the Rose Bowl and is legitimately good and looks like they're building on something, I mean, you go out there to USC, they show you a great time on your official visit. It's, it's, it's big city. You know, I guess they have the NFL now, but you still kind of feel like you're an NFL player sort there. Of, sort and, of. Yeah, you know, dear God, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, and there's just not really another recruiting power west of the Rocky Mountains. Right, Washington has a nice class. Right, Oregon's doing a good job Stanford's under Willie well, Taggart. Stanford has a good class, yeah. but can anybody really hang with, with USC out there? Not really. It, it's kind of USC is right at first refusal on a lot of these kids in the Western time zone. Well, and Bud knows as well as I do from actually being on the ground talking to kids after that USC visit. They come back with stars in their eyes. A lot of these kids are from small towns. Yep. They've mm -hmm. never been to a gorgeous beach city with amazing nightlife, and there's so much going on there. There are things there and, that And kids because Dan Rubenstein's here, we have to mention L.A. has great food. Amazing mm -hmm. food, mm -hmm. amazing great food. tacos. Tacos! <laughs> there's, there's stuff there that they've never seen, and right. so it really kind of opens their eyes to their world is bigger than they even thought could have even imagined yeah. yeah 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 that makes sense god i really just want to be in la right now yeah we're in new york it's Tacos. february congratulations to us <laughs> um give me one player that has gone in a different direction than you thought they would not necessarily today but just maybe in the last month somebody that you thought wow everybody said this kid was going to school a and they are not going there i'm going to say marcavius bryant okay uh, i spoke with him at uh, the under armor all american game there in orlando he told me that Georgia had a very slim lead over Auburn. Uh, and then this kind of whole past week, even Georgia people thought we're going to lose him to LSU. Mm -hmm. Where does he go? Auburn. So the, the, <laughs> the school that there was like no smoke about. Uh, yeah, they, they get a really quality pass rusher out, out of the state of Georgia. And you know, Auburn's always, always recruited well in Georgia, so it can't be that big of a surprise. But I, I really didn't see anybody picking Auburn for him down the stretch. Yeah, Ronnie Gardner. He never ruled that guy out. He's going to recruit really well. Um, for me, Aubrey Solomon, potentially not a huge surprise today, but in the last month or so, yeah. definitely a surprise. This, for me, is actually probably the most fun story of signing day. Committed to Michigan for a long time, decommits because he received a thank you note for attending a barbecue that he actually didn't go right, to. Right. And was his name misspelled but as well? But his name was misspelled. Yeah. I mean, come on. And so he didn't feel wanted by Michigan. I certainly cannot blame right. him. So the work that Michigan had to do to recover from that and still land this guy at a position that is not everywhere this class. DTs are, are in demand this class. So really nice work there by Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. But that's that to me is the funniest story, getting a thank you note for <laughs> barbecue didn't show up. Right. At. And uh, during the Army Bowl, uh, he was on something I don't think he realized was live video. Oh, and okay. he yes. said something derogatory about Michigan and then <laughs> later yeah. apologized for that uh so he you kind of wonder if he was setting it up to throw a curveball because he sure. named alabama his leader then there was a lot of really positive comments about georgia all of a sudden at the end of the day it's michigan maybe just trying to create a little drama here well it certainly wouldn't put it past him either especially yeah. this kid michigan better get his name right on his jersey <laughs> just i'll just say that i'll just say that it's um, right on the loi like yeah. there's so <laughs> many places yeah there's a lot that could go wrong yeah. here um we have an announcement we have a commit that we want to bring up ohio state it's Thayer Munford, but your thoughts? Uh, I think he's a really quality lineman and somebody that can help Ohio State. That class is, I mean, w what are they at now? Let, let, let's see if this is even updated. Five, five stars? Yep. 13, four stars? <laughs> uh, their, okay. their average commit rating is like a 94.7, which will round that to 95, but that's still like a, like they're averaging like a mid to high four star. That, that's actually a higher average recruit ranking than Alabama has. Right. Now, Alabama, the difference is that Bama has... Seemingly a limited room in their recruit shopping cart, uh, and they have 26 commits. Ohio State has 21. Uh, but look, in any other, not in any other year, but in a lot of other years, guys, Ohio State would have had the number one class in the country mm -hmm. with this group. They just happen to have it in a year where Bama has this ridiculous class coming in. Well, and how many number ones at their position do they have? Three, I think. Chase Young, defensive end. Baron Browning, outside linebacker. Jeffrey Okuda. Yeah top corner so three of the number one it's good to be a Buckeye yeah and, especially with such a small class too like 21 right. is not a huge class like right. Bud was saying and they're not losing a lot very of guys top, it's a nice top heavy yeah class. yeah so you know. it's it's cheesecake it's very rich and I they like it. uh I like it. New it's, York <laughs> she's <laughs> alluding to something we're gonna do later it's not cheesecake but it is dessert <laughs> right. good. um good. we also we're taking your questions on Facebook we're taking them on Twitter uh, at SBN recruiting so later in the show, if you have questions about uh, your class, a player, recruiting in general, bud skin regimen, whatever you want to know, we are happy to answer it uh, here because 
I mean, come on, what else are we going to do today? Um, okay, anything else that has stuck out to you guys as particularly weird or interesting or just just special so far early in today? Special. Count these scrolls. How many times do you have to scroll down to find this team? Okay. <laughs> okay, there was a little scroll I, I up there. Little, little, little little scribble. Scribble. So I, I think that's like four and a half. Call it four. Okay. That team right. is Texas. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. 17 commits. I'm not saying that they lack quality. I mean, they have seven four stars, 10 three stars. So they're not taking like an 80% three star class or something like right. that. But didn't get chasing. You know, d didn't get. Um, uh, our guy we like who, who went to UCLA this morning, the offensive tackle out of Austin. It, mm -hmm. Not a great day so far for Texas. Their, their message boards are kind of having a little meltdown. That doesn't now, sound like Texas at all. They, uh, they Texas did, message boards losing it. They, I don't know. They but. flipped a UCF commit last night, Okay. Uh, oh. which is interesting. But I think if there's an upside there for Texas, it's that they're not reaching. Mm -hmm. right? They're not trying to fill this class out with numbers because they don't have to. They, Texas returns a lot of production for next year. If you look at Bill Connolly's uh, returning production stats on SB Nation, they have one of the highest percentages in the country. Next year, I think, will, will be the, the year that Tom Herman's impact has truly felt, assuming he takes that Texas talent that Charlie Strong assembled and turns it into wins on the field. What, well, do, you, what do you think is just generally the goal for somebody who comes in their first, sort of that stub year as a coach, where you haven't had a whole year to recruit? What's sort of the general, okay, you should do the following X things, and you can say that recruiting season was successful? I mean, I kind of look for, in that short amount of time, you have five, six weeks potentially to get to know people that maybe you haven't been getting to build those relationships yep. with all year long, and we know recruiting is all about relationships. I mean, that first class, I almost just erase it from my memory. Like, yep. you just hope it's just not terrible. Really, you're looking at the next class to see how a coach really does. And going back to Texas, I think the the good thing for Tom Herman there is that Charlie Strong recruited incredibly well. Right. So there are, there's a lot of talent already there, even though this class is going to be disappointing. And they did lose a lot of the top talent in Texas going out of state, especially to Ohio State. Ohio State got a lot of those Texas guys. Um, but Tom Herman, I think next year is really when you start being, Trying you start judging how well bit, yeah. you're doing. Yeah. And, and they've certainly, it's definitely a different situation there than I think Oregon, for instance, because of what you're stepping into in terms of previous recruiting classes. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, we have another update. Boy, uh, Alabama's day one. just somehow gets better. LeBron Ray. Maybe the least surprising commitment of the day okay. has two teammates who already already went there. Yep. Uh, I don't think anybody at Florida Ten or Tennessee who actually employed by Florida or Tennessee thought they were going to get it. Maybe some of their fans did, but that one I think has been lock city for years. Okay. Uh, really versatile defensive line. I think can play the three technique. Uh, not so much a nose, but in, in Bama's you know system, they're they're now running a little more little more four two five because they play these spread teams like a Clemson. Uh, he can play inside pass rusher there and also play the, the, the three and, and stop the run for them. Really quality kid uh, out of uh, is it, uh, uh, Madison, Alabama, yep, I believe. Yep, you so, know yeah. Yeah. Uh, he was a lot of fun to watch uh, at some of the All-Star events, the opening and the Under Armour game. He was really impressive to me. And a kid, I think, with it, you look at him, young in the face. He's not overaged for the class. He's right. going to get bigger and better, whereas some of these guys, you come out and you're like, you kind of look like a 35-year-old NFL veteran <laughs> looking for a team. <laughs> I yeah. can't. If I had, if I was paid off of how many times I mistook a player for somebody's dad, <laughs> I'm like, why do you have a full beard? Right, and you're right. like, oh, hello, I'm 15 it's, years old. Like, what? Yeah, what is right. happening? Where's your hairline? <laughs> what? I don't understand. What's you're going bald, here. and you like just said you're sweet 16. Like, what's <laughs> happening? Yeah, sure. Cam Robinson at the opening, I thought was one of the NFL counselors. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. Well, I didn't know they were out here already on Tuesday. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's a high school. As somebody with a natural baby face, I can assure you I've never had this problem. Um, I'm projecting more growth in you, though. Uh, they're but, I, high upside. High upside. I, I, that's the nicest thing anybody could possibly say. <laughs> um, yeah, he's 6'4", 260. He's already, like, the idea that you take a player like this and you're like, oh, there's still room for development. Mm -hmm. that's, that's absolutely terrifying. He could be 290 within 18 months. I mean, most of us could. He's just well, not in the way that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, but you'd be at East Mississippi Junior College if, if you I don't. That uh, so. that's, I'm not that's, sure if I could accomplish that. That's a really good point. Um, I know we're going to talk to uh, one of our Georgia bloggers fairly soon here, but before we do, let's just talk super generally. Georgia has not necessarily come out of nowhere, but is doing something this year that they were not able to do under Mark Rick. Mark Rick's recruiting classes were always good, but they were in, it feels like the 8 to 12 range right. good. They didn't have a number, if, if I'm right here, they didn't have a top five class since 2009. And the fact that they are hanging with 
some very, very big recruiting names right now is really impressive. Do you guys have any perspective on why that is or how that's come to be? I think maybe part of it is that well, Kirby Smart has always been a very good recruiter, but he recruited the state of Georgia for Alabama. Yep. So he's done an amazing job of keeping those guys home. Overwhelming majority of their class are guys from Georgia. And then he's been able to grab a couple of really big pieces nationally, running back DeAndre Swift out of the Northeast, as well as Isaiah, the, the, Isaiah Wilson, Isaiah Wilson, Wilson yeah. the giant lineman from Brooklyn, where all good linemen come uh -huh. from yep. uh, out New of Brooklyn. York City invented offensive line. Yes, uh, solid offensive line play out uh -huh. there. Uh, in, in Brooklyn, but yeah, he's he's a really solid piece for them as well, so he's done a really nice job. You know, and you think about it, Kirby played there. He, right. he was a GA at Florida State, which recruits the state heavily. Yeah. His entire life has been Georgia football. Mm -hmm. and, and let's talk a little bit about how tough it is to recruit, and everybody wants, let's let's put a fence around the uh, around the state of Georgia and, and, and keep those kids in state. Well, that, that's probably tougher in Georgia than any other state for yep. this reason. I go down 75, Tallahassee, Gainesville, to the west, you know, you got Auburn, you got Alabama. To the north, Tennessee recruits it pretty hard. Clemson, North Carolina, South Carolina to the east. That's a lot easier said than done. Kirby Smart deserves a lot of credit for this. To Amy's point as well, they're, they're really trying to get – they built this class the day he was he was signed, right? Kirby Smart was hired. It, yep. They went out, they talked to the juniors. They Georgia actually had a freshman day. A lot of these schools, like Alabama uh, last weekend had a junior day where they invite all these juniors to come on and get familiar with the campus. Mm -hmm. Georgia had a freshman day this year. That they're really taking it to the young kids, and they're trying to inspire this state Georgia pride in these kids. Like normally, the Alabama kids have a lot of state pride, right? They they rep for Alabama. So do the Mississippi kids when we go to the Alabama Mississippi All Star game. Georgia kids in the past doesn't seem like they've had that. Maybe a little more now. That there's kind of a little more trying to build that in correct. at an earlier age. That's How smart. long do you think before we see Jim Harbaugh do like a kindergarten day? <laughs> Visiting OBGYN is what I'm really worried about. Oh. What yeah. I'm really... We're going to have Optimus Day at Ann Arbor. This is going to be an ultrasound like you've never seen. Um, all right, we've got Jeremy Attaway from Dog Sports on the line. Jeremy, first and foremost, thank you for joining us. And how are you feeling so far on signing day? I, I'm feeling pretty good. I mean, I, I think uh, Kirby Smart did the things he needed to do at Georgia. He took over a roster with some holes in the defensive backfield and on the offensive line. He emphasized those areas, picked up some guys uh, throughout the process who fill critical needs, and uh, just generally uh, started the process of upgrading the Georgia roster. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit about the difference in how Kirby Smart's been able to do this uh, as compared to Mark Richt, but what sticks out to you? Is, is it tone? Is it sort of approach and who George is going after? Why, why has Kirby Smart been able to see relatively quick success as a recruiter where Mark Rick could never quite get to this level? Yeah, it's one of those things. We have kind of told our readers it's important to temper your enthusiasm a little bit. I mean, Lane Kiffin signed the top class in America his first full cycle at Tennessee. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it helps to remember these things. But what Kirby Smart has really done is he has – while you can't put a fence around the state of Georgia, as you were saying, uh, you can recruit a lot better in-state than Mark Rick did, uh, especially in, in sort of the waning years of his administration. Uh, you look at a guy like Richie LeCount, uh, you know, five-star prospect from Liberty County in southeast Georgia. Uh, Richie LeCount's high school coach is a, a former Georgia Bulldog tight end, and uh, he also coached Raquan McMillan. Uh, who, of course, uh, number one inside linebacker recruited a few years ago who went to Ohio State. Um, Kirby Smart is getting a lot of guys in this cycle who would have gone to Ohio State, would have gone to Clemson. He, he sort of uh, instilled among them a little bit of a pride uh, in representing their home state, made that a rallying point, uh, really, for, for this squad. And, uh, again, he, as you said, has done a freshman day. He's gotten guys on campus really as much as they're comfortable coming. Uh, if, if they're willing to make the trip to Athens, uh, he's willing to have them. And, uh, you know, that familiarity built over time uh, is really a powerful recruiting tool. Who's the player uh, that's already committed to Georgia this cycle that you are most excited about as a fan that you look at and say, that's somebody that I'm going to love seeing in a Georgia uniform, and more importantly, I'm really glad I'm not going to have to see them in somebody else's uniform. Yeah, there are a couple of guys who really fit that description, and the best part is that they're already on campus. Uh, one guy you look at is Richie LeCount, who I mentioned a moment ago, uh, defensive back, probably going to play safety. Uh, doesn't necessarily have the best intangibles. He's a guy who's about 5'11", uh, 
uh, maybe five eleven and a half, uh, but really tenacious player, uh, covers a lot of ground, plays bigger than he is, and he's really been the ringleader of this class for Georgia from really from the get-go. Uh, he and Jake Fromm, uh, quarterback, uh, Gatorade Player of the Year in Georgia out of Houston County High School, uh, another guy who really very early on made the decision in his recruitment, committed to Alabama, really liked Kirby Smart, liked what he was doing at Georgia, flipped to Georgia and uh, hasn't wavered, has gone out and recruited very hard. Uh, those are guys who are not necessarily going to make a huge impact in 2017, but down the line, they're the kind of players you need you know, to form a nucleus if you're, if you're really going to turn a program around and get it to the next level. Um, before we let you go, Jeremy, I'm going to turn that last question around on you. Who's the one player that you thought or maybe hoped Georgia was going to get this cycle that they missed out on? I think the answer, if you're a Georgia fan, has to be Lee County defensive tackle Aubrey Solomon. Uh, you know, five-star player. Some people, myself included, thought perhaps the, the best college prospect in the state. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're going to compete, if you're going to win in the SEC, you're going to have to have a ton of depth uh, up front offensively and defensively. Um, Georgia had the luxury of not really needing to hit a home run on the defensive line in this class. They played four true freshmen. Uh, up front last season, uh, including starting at least two of them uh, at points. So Georgia didn't necessarily need another five-star defensive tackle, but if there's one uh, in an area that's generally very pro-Bulldog who's available, you'd like to get that guy just to go ahead and build that depth. Uh, Michigan, I think, is getting a really, truly good player, a guy who could contribute as a true freshman uh, in Aubrey Solomon. I'm assuming Jim Harbaugh got him at his uh, fourth grade day uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that he planned several years ago. The guy, the guy really, really is on the cutting edge. He's always three steps ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. And as much as it pains me to say it as a Florida fan, congratulations on a very successful signing day for Georgia. And, and congratulations on. Hang on, I'm trying to find Florida I players. Know, I know. Did I give out one star? Oh, no. that's fine. We will never have that. I'm <laughs> Thanks, Jeremy. <laughs> What, uh, Times are changing. It's, it's <laughs> fine. I mean, it's fine. We don't have to talk about it. Uh, I do like. I didn't realize yeah, this we when we were planning the show, but what I like is that when we're showing clips of Georgia commits, it still has Jeremy's info up there. So if you just are tuning into the show at this point, you think that's Jeremy <laughs> doing <laughs> acrobatic things on a football field. So congratulations, Jeremy. We that's pretty we impressive. You up pretty well here. Is that um, eligibility left? It looks great. How uh, it, how important do you think it is now for Kirby Smart to really produce on the field in the next year or two years? Like now, I'm thinking the expectations must be so high there now after recruiting at this level. I think it's extremely, uh, especially when you look at the East. It looks very winnable, right? I mean, Butch Jones. Yes. A lot of people think, you know, would Butch Jones still be around if his buyout wasn't that high? If Tennessee had actually already made an athletic director hire, we we don't know. Uh, their, their recruiting class is, is not that great. You know, Jim McElwain has, has won the SCs twice. They've seen a reload on defense every year. They lose a lot on defense this year. They have to take a step on offense. Georgia could be primed to win the East this year, and if they don't, I think Kirby Smart will get a lot of questions because yeah. the question is, hey, who can come in here and make all this talent work? But I, I think because of, of how well they're recruiting, the flip side of that is it, it'll buy him some time, right? Because yeah. the argument for him is going to be, hey, give me some time to work with these guys. I signed them. It's my vision. That's why I'm doing a freshman day. You know, you got to give me until at least like 2022. What's the point in doing <laughs> yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And it doesn't start out easy for Georgia next year either. They start with App State at home, a team that we know can give you trouble, although last year Miami didn't really blink. Uh, and then they immediately go on the road to Notre Dame. So there will be – those are two weeks that I think already are burrowed somewhere in Georgia fans' mind of like, oh, if we lose this, F, oof, 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 just driving me insane. Um, let's talk a little bit about big picture. Recruiting class – you know, I think a lot of people look at recruiting classes as sort of like – the world's most wonderful buffet. It has everything you want, it's fully stocked, it's very clean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But to me, and I think you guys agree with this, recruiting classes are more like Halloween candy halls, where like some years you get more Starburst, <laughs> some years more Snickers. So let's talk about where this class is particularly strong. Sometimes the dentist next door gives you a toothbrush. Oh. Is that just me or did that God. just me? Okay. You didn't have to take it. <laughs> You just throw it away. <laughs> like a like a dental floss in a tooth, right? <laughs> it's like, thank you, doctor. All right, so we won't talk about what the dental floss in this year's <laughs> recruiting class is, who's, but... Who's this year's dental floss? If we're, looking at, if we're looking at position groups that you say, this class is super deep yeah. at this, what is one of those groups that stand out to you, bud? 
Uh, offensive tackle. Yeah. Probably the best offensive tackle class we've seen since I've been doing this. Okay. Uh, for sure. Foster Sherrell out of the state of Washington, Walker Little out of Texas, both of whom went to Stanford. Uh, in my opinion, probably the number one and number two offensive tackles in the country. I mean, guys who are legit 6'6", 6'7", 315. And a lot of times, like if you all follow basketball, it takes big men in basketball a little while to get acclimated to their bodies. Mm -hmm. They're, they're kind of long and lanky like a baby giraffe. They're not really sure what they're doing. That's not the case with these kids. These kids are athletic, man. They, they, they can 360 dunk. They, they can, if they stay healthy, they're essential NFL locks in three years. Alex Leatherwood going to Alabama as well, and not quite as long as those two other guys, but I think he's probably the nastiest offensive tackle in this class, a dude who just loves to pancake block people. Uh, you, you saw him actually practicing with Alabama before the national championship game. Didn't look at all out of place in like the 30 seconds of footage Alabama will let you shoot. Uh, and, and it just goes on and on. This Calvin Ashley, who signed with Auburn, another kid who was originally from Florida, went up there to uh, St. John's um, in, in, you know, outside of Maryland, gave Maryland fans a, a thought they had some chance at him. <laughs> Ultimately, he sticks with another Under Armour school in Auburn. And uh, it, it goes on and on. The offensive tackle class this year is, is really good. Maybe. Yeah, I think uh, running backs as well. I, yeah. One of the comparisons that's been made is uh, similar to the class of 2014 that had guys like Leonard Fournette, Dalvin Cook. Obviously, those guys are now moving on. Yeah, we've, we've heard of them, yeah. Yeah, we've, I, mean, I don't know if you've heard of them. So I think uh, especially uh, an offshoot of that is Florida State has to be very, very happy. They're losing Dalvin, but they're bringing in t uh, two top running backs in the number one running back, Cam Akers, and then um, Kalen LeBorn as well, who uh, is also a five-star. If you remember, he committed in a, in a Lamborghini, I believe it was. Don't worry. Um, so, Isn't that how we all yeah, decide where we're that's, going? That's my coach. style right there. Yep. So, yeah, just absolutely reloading. And then we mentioned uh, Najee Harris going to Alabama. Again, um, going to be, you know, just reloading there as well in the uh, clone of Alabama running back. So, basically, this is the year where you can build a really, really good run game for, like, a year or two from now. That's true, yes. yeah, because you've got the terrible. offensive line. And mm. the so, if you didn't do those things, sorry. You're going to have a bad time. Yes. Basically. That's well, and, and speaking of that offensive line, yeah. too, I mean, we just got to give Stanford a lot of credit because they have yeah. two five star, two top 10 offensive tackles heading yeah. to Stanford. There's a lot to look this forward is to. Like, out there. This is Stanford's thing now, though, which I really enjoy that they've decided, like, yes, we're just going to be offensive lineman university. Intellectual brutality is, is their hashtag. It's wonderful. <laughs> Intellectual brutality. Yeah, you've yeah. seen that. I mean, there's not a whole lot of people tweeting about <laughs> Stanford, but when thing. I do see it, I'm like, okay, that's a okay. pretty good Yeah, well, and they've got the nation's top quarterback in this class, top tight end. Right. So so, yeah, people need to not be sleeping on Stanford. Never. We will never, never. sleep. Willie on Taggart's job at Oregon is much tougher than what Chip Kelly had when he be came in. Because oh, of Stanford? Uh, because of Stanford, because yeah. of Washington, because USC is not on sanctions. Uh, it, it's it's a very different challenge that he has there now in the Pacific Northwest. Even UCLA, I feel like, is a better they get players. Is a better position recruiting program than, I mean, yeah, we I, I was talking about this a while ago, but if you look at the coaches who were in the Pac-12 when Chip Kelly came in, yeah, it's a it's a, ooh, it's a rough list. It's a very different company. What are they doing like, now? Oh, he's an assistant with the Lions now. <laughs> cool, congratulations. So is Al Golden. Oh, come. he had to do it. You knew he was going <laughs> to do it at some point. Um, let's talk about real quickly. Are there are there particular areas? I don't want to say weaknesses of this class, but places where maybe there aren't uh, there isn't depth that we would have seen in years past. Places where you say, okay. They're good guys, but if you didn't get them, it's a little bit slim pickings-wise. Yeah, I, I think the drop-off at defensive tackle this year is very steep. I know Richard Johnson uh, looked this up for a piece he did for SB Nation. And then, look, we usually have about four or five-star defensive tackles on an annual basis. Yeah. This year we have two. Mm -hmm. Marvin Wilson, who commits today at 430, and then Aubrey Solomon, who we just discussed, is, you know, out of Georgia going to, to Michigan. Yep. By the way, not necessarily – he hasn't always lived in Georgia, by the way. That's what I, want, I wanted to, you know, to mention earlier. When Georgia lost him, it wasn't like they were losing a kid who was like – Born in Georgia, grew right. up a Bulldog fan. He was a military brat, moved around a lot. Uh, so it, it's not quite as big of a loss for, from that perspective of losing like a longtime UGA fan or anything. But the drop-off this year is steep. USC is getting, getting two excellent kids on the West Coast. If you're a team on the East Coast and you need D tackles this year, whew, and especially because several of these kids are projected to perhaps not qualify. I mean, mm -hmm. so if you remove those from the class, the, the drop-off is steep. I, I know – it's it's tough, man. Well, yeah, and that's the key, too. The, uh, two of the other top defensive tackles in the South, Fidarian Mathis, LeBron Wright, they're going to Alabama. So, right. once again, Alabama Jerks. takes whatever Jerks. they want. <laughs> and then Solomon's going to Michigan, leaving the South. And Wilson, we'll see what happens with him. But it's uh, it's slim pickings out there at that uh, position. Tough times. We uh, all know it's it's a line of scrimmage league. Let's, let's talk to somebody who... Thank you, Will is probably feeling fine. I mean, he always is. Matt Brown is probably the nicest person that we work with at SB Nation. 
Uh, he's calling in on behalf of Land Grant Holy Land to talk about Ohio State on signing day. Matt, my buddy, my pal, how are you feeling at this point in the day? Hey, friends. You know, I'm feeling pretty good. I, I just got, I had some additional caffeine go through me. Uh, Ohio State just picked up another four-star offensive lineman. All the drama's all basically done. So, uh, yeah, I, I feel about as good as anybody who, who has to follow National Signing Day can feel. Overall, would you say that drama mostly, where it concerned Ohio State at least, did it mostly go Urban Meyer's way or did it tilt a little bit away? It tilted a little bit away. Ohio State was looking for a third defensive tackle because, like you were saying earlier, that's a position uh, really a scarcity nationwide and certainly within Ohio State. I mean, to the extent that a team that recruits like Ohio State has real weaknesses, as you know, uh, and and they, they they tried to go get Jay Tufele out of um, out of Salt Lake City. He when he goes to USC, um, Ohio State's you know hoping to get Marvin Wilson, uh, who will probably go to uh, either Florida State or LSU. But but other other than that, I mean, basically everybody else was signed, sealed, and delivered by eight thirty this morning. What do you think is the one area of Ohio State's roster that? most improved today that you look at and say, okay, a month ago, maybe I was a little iffy about this, but now I look and say, yes, that's that's where the Buckeyes are improving. So the, the, the key position group in this recruiting class is within Ohio State secondary. The Buckeyes are once again losing a ton of players who are leaving early to go to the NFL draft. Players like Marcus Lattimore, Darion Conley, or Malik Hooker, uh, which has hurt the depth of what was already a relatively young group within the safeties and cornerbacks. The Buckeyes, I think, addressed that uh, real, so better than anybody else in the country for this particular uh, in this recruiting class. They're bringing in Jeffrey Okuda, who's a you know a huge five-star, top ten player in the country. You're bringing in Sean Wade a top-five defensive back, also a five-star. Isaiah Pryor, who's a safety, who's nearly a five-star. The, the, the defensive back and safety grouping within Ohio State's 2017 class, I think is better than perhaps any other single position group within anybody else's recruiting class. It's truly outstanding. And and the good news, of course, and I'm going to throw some shade here, just be warned, uh, they get That's to fine. face Big Ten quarterbacks. And isn't that great? If you're an elite corner, cornerback, wouldn't Why you love wouldn't it? you play? I mean, yeah, it's the best of all possible worlds. Um, Man, I was worried there for a second when you said you were going to throw a shade. I was like, oh, is this, is this a Clemson joke? Oh, no, oh, if you want to go no, throw a shade, no, I'm like, Michigan State quarterbacks. You, well, know, you know I can't. If we had had Luke on, I would have said that. But I can't. You're too nice. I can't do that to you. <laughs> so you made a good choice here. Um, all right, I'll ask you the question we're asking all our, all our team guys just to really make them uncomfortable. Who's the one player that Ohio State didn't get today, that you thought they might have, that you were hoping they would have, that you are just feeling that loss most acutely? Who's burning your soul a little bit today? Well, uh, I, I think any actual soul burning I have right now is probably a, a remnant of the strep throat and ear infection I've been fighting <laughs> over the past couple of days, rather than anything actually recruiting related. It would have been nice for Ohio State to get to fail that because – the Buckeyes have, have swung and missed on a couple of four- and five-star defensive tackles recently. That is a position that tends to be concentrated uh, in the southeast or in the west, and that's a little bit harder for Ohio State to go reach out and grab those kids because they're not in Ohio or Michigan or some of these places where Ohio State recruits all the time. And they have two really good defensive tackles in this class, but they're probably going to miss on two other ones here today, and that would have been nice to maybe shift the narrative a little bit. Um, and also, you know, it would make a bunch of Utah fans in my timeline mad, which would be a double bonus for somebody like me. You live a very convoluted life is, I think, the best way I can uh, compare uh, yeah. <laughs> A demographic anomaly, I think, is uh, yes. how I'm constantly described. That, 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 that is what sense. it is. A census, a census taker has no idea where to exactly place you in which, like, Venn diagram at this point. There's The, the Venn diagram of your life is just you. So congratulations yeah. on that. Um, uh, any other any other things that you want to share with us about Ohio State signing today before we let you go? Yeah, the the other thing that I think is going to be fun to watch for Ohio State over the next couple of years, and this continued today, is going to be what happens in their quarterback room. The, the Buckeyes picked up uh, Tate Martell out of Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas, who is uh, one of, if not the uh, best dual threat quarterback in the country, and he's somebody who's was kind of straddling that four or five star range, but some concerns about his height uh, may have dipped him a little bit, and he's headed into a, like a, a loaded. Ohio State quarterback room that, that just brought in a high four-star quarterback last year and has a five-star committed for next year. So it's going to be fascinating to see, one, if, if 
whether the assessments about Martel were, were correct, given his height and his trajectory, and two, uh, who sticks around? Because the odds of a uh, you know very high, highly regarded quarterback transferring out of Ohio State if they don't get the job in the next year or two, I think that's pretty strong. Fair enough. Uh, thank you, Matt. We appreciate it. Go have a great day. We love you, buddy. Oh, hey. You, you, you two friends. Be sure to get plenty of sleep after today. You know I have a baby and that won't happen, but thank you anyway. Um, <laughs> Godspeed. But who sticks out Terribly to you? Terribly nice guy. Uh, Matt is the Terribly nicest. Terribly nice. It's almost uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, but who sticks out to you from this Ohio State recruiting class is somebody who's really just like... Well, it's only like a two-hour show, right? It's gonna, I, I mean... It's uh, going to take a while. Uh, <laughs> I know I mentioned earlier they've got a lot of the top guys at their position. I forgot yeah. to mention they have the top guard as well in Wyatt yeah. Davis. So that's the top guard, the top defensive end, Chase Young, top cornerback, Jeffrey Okuda, top outside linebacker, Baron Browning. And uh, Matt mentioned losing a lot of depth in the secondary. Obviously, they've got Okuda, but they've also got Sean Wade, who's mm -hmm. the number four cornerback, and Juco cornerback, number one Juco cornerback, Kendall Sheffield, who signed with Alabama recently. So, again, this is the cheesecake class for me. <laughs> this is ridiculous. I I, I think what really sticks out as well is the length at corner, right? Mm -hmm. Matt mentioned it. Okuda, 6'1 one and a half. Sean Wade out of Jacksonville, 6'1. I mean, they got, they got the number one and the number two corners in the country going to Ohio State, and both are real long guys that you can play press with, and that presents right. problems off the line. Amy mentioned Wyatt Davis. Wyatt Davis could have played FBS football as like a 16-year-old and not looked like that out of place. Right. I right. mean, yeah. it, it, he dominates guys. A lot of pancakes. Uh, he was pancaking people in pass rush drills, uh, which is really impressive as well. Here you can see it at the Army practices there. And, uh, and watch him pull here. Nice, nice balance. Gets out really quickly. Leading the way for Najee Harris, one of the running backs. And he's going to pancake this guy again. Oh. <laughs> oh. I love pancakes. Uh, pancakes are delicious. <laughs> I didn't get pancakes. And, uh, look, oh, it, it, we, need, <laughs> oh we need food for every segment. Is, that's my pitch for it, next it, time. That's really going to hurt. If I'm filming you as an offensive lineman, yeah. and I have to take my camera like whip to the right because you're driving your guy out of the frame that fast in a drill, against another all-star. I think that was Aubrey Solomon who's going to Michigan, by the way. So we'll see that Ohio State again. fans yeah, won't hate right. that. Yeah. That, that. That's a lot of skill because most yeah. big guys can't move that fast anyway. If you can move another all-star human that quickly yeah. in a drill that's weighted against you, I, I, I like that. We had a segment all queued up here that was going to be. Here's, I'm going to read it verbatim. Race for the number one class. That feels stupid now because, as you said, <laughs> that race is over. Oh, that God. race is over before we started the show. But before, before, we, before we got on the air today, this morning, there was some talk that, I know, it feels stupid even saying that Alabama wasn't going to finish with it. But let's, we have a graphic here just to show you what Alabama's been able to do in all of Nick Saban's full recruiting classes and they're gonna find it i know they're looking for it right? i know they're, there we go um there it's you go just, it's just it's, <laughs> i mean because you see in those first three years those first three full years because this doesn't count this doesn't count his 2007 class that he signed but they're hanging around the top and then it just the other thing this graphic doesn't tell you is that there are you know recruiting rankings are really useful to tell you where you line up relative to your peers but they don't show you gaps necessarily. Like mm. you can be the number three one year and not be near number one, or you can also not be near number five. That th these are not necessarily going to say how far ahead you are. But the fact that I mean, seven straight years of number one classes. Teams don't just sign twenty-two, four, and five stars. <laughs> Five-star players don't just grace you. This is not normal, folks. All right, it, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not. This is right. not normal. And if you look back up that graphic, oh wait, who beat them out? Urban Meyer, when he had stuff rolling at Florida. Yep. 2010, I think, was Florida. 2009, I think, was USC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I guess we could hypothetically go over how Alabama could have not finished with the number one class. Like, if Ohio State had gotten uh, Jay Tufeli yep. and, and Thayer, like they did get, and Alabama had, let's say, missed on Drez Parks, uh, missed on LeBron Ray, these things all seemed like total impossibilities. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they're not going to miss on a kid from Alabama yeah. like that. Missed on Henry Ruggs. Uh -huh. Right. Then it would have been close. And then if some, like, 200 kids decided to flip or something on signing day and Alabama decided we're not going to replace them, then it'd be a real possibility that Ohio State might overtake them. If Nick Saban decided to retire the morning of signing yeah. well, day. Maybe their fax machine broke. That's another way. Alabama all could of the not fax sign. machines in America <laughs> stopped the, working. I guarantee they have at least three backup fax machines. All of the faxes stopped working. Next fax machine up. That's how it works on Sunday. Um, do your job. Now, you're joking, but 
are we just waiting for Nick Saban to retire at this point to figure out who will be number one other than Alabama? Because seven straight years, I mean, you're right, it doesn't just happen, except that it does. That it does. So at this point, it kind of feels like we're just saying, all right, whoever's next at Alabama, you have impossible shoes to fill, and that probably feels like where we will go back to the years where it's maybe the same teams that we're talking mm -hmm. about, but who's number one tr gets traded around a little bit. Is that right? Well, I, I think so because Nick Saban is obviously the common denominator. That's a no-brainer, but there's been so much turnover on that staff over the years. And even this week, nobody's talked about the fact that wide receivers coach Billy Napier left about a week right, ago, right. and nobody's even talking about it, and it hasn't right. affected anything. So really, he is the common denominator there. <laughs> Class size might get him one of these years, okay. right? Like if they get a number of guys who decide I'm not going to go pro, I'm going to stay at Alabama, and they just can't physically get in another class of 25. Like if they this year, look, Ohio State had a higher star rating, right? Ohio State's average player is rated higher than Alabama, so Alabama just managed to sign six more of them. If those scenarios were flipped, like, I mean, Ohio State didn't lose anybody off this team. Whenever that year comes up for Alabama, there's a possibility they could slip to like two or three. Mm -hmm. Well, and he's convincing guys to take gray shirts as well. Right. Like, guys who would be probably the cornerstone of a class at uh, many, many would other schools. Would Parks be the number one rated kid in Florida's class? Why do we keep talking about Florida? Or, or, like, ten or Tennessee's. Or, well, not Tennessee's because <laughs> they, they got Trey Smith. It but. might be. I don't know. <sighs> It's not fair. In a um, lot of classes, he would be the number one kid, and he's going to gray shirt at Alabama. I mean, that just I think that's, that's the picture right there. Jeez. It says it all. All right, let's talk about, listen. It's not all roses for Alabama. Should we explain what gray shirt is, by the way? Real quick. If you want to, yeah, sure. That's when you, you sign, but you delay your <coughs> enrollment until the next spring so that you're not counted in the NCAA's initial counter class numbers because the NCAA limits how many people you can it's sign. Like a promise Thank ring. God that they do because otherwise it's really not a fair show. We, right. We just call it the Alabama Ohio State show. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he's going to delay his enrollment a semester. It's like sure. it's the commitment without the benefits. So oh, yes. boy, <laughs> without you can't practice with the team. You can't have the nutrition. You have to pay for school. You're not on scholarship. So yeah. really, it is like I'm showing up. Sounds great. Pretending. <laughs> Sounds awesome. All the same things are there. Yeah. Um, let's. So as I said, it's not all roses for Alabama. <laughs> you might remember that their most recent game they lost to Clemson, but Clemson right now does not have a top five class now. We're going to take a look at who they have signed right now, and, and there are definitely some top names on this list. Are there not, bud? Oh, very much so. I think T. Higgins might be the best receiver in the country if you look at upside, right? But one of your true, like, go get it, long receivers. They, they stole him away from Tennessee. Great signing for Clemson there. Look, Cle receivers tend to do pretty well at Clemson. That, that's probably a good choice. Mm -hmm. Hunter Johnson out of Indianapolis, the, the number one rated dual threat for a while. I don't know where he finished up, but I think he finished up around a five star. Uh, A.J. Terrell, one of the guys that actually got away from Georgia. Out of, out of that state, another long corner. I know a lot of people liked him a lot. Georgia liked him. Florida liked him. Uh, Amari Rogers. This is a fun kid to watch because of how Clemson gets the ball to guys in space. Yep. Amari Rogers has moves like a running back, and he's kind of built like a running back, but he catches the ball so well that he's actually going to play receiver for them. And then Justin Foster, a guy, uh, was listed at linebacker. I'm glad we have him listed at defensive end because I think that's what he's going to play at Clemson. Clemson's class is small, much like we mentioned. They didn't lose a whole lot of guys off that team. They lost big names, but not, you know, not big numbers. Next year's the class that really we need to be looking at Clemson. So, so let's talk about that first. Why are we worried about, if you're a Clemson fan, should you be worried about this class and that it's not ranking particularly high, or should you be putting all your eggs into the 2018 basket? No, I, I wouldn't be worried at all. Okay. Uh, because their, their average recruit ranking is extremely high. They just didn't have the number of spots. And what we've seen in the past, it's not the class you sign six weeks after winning the national title. Right. It's the class you sign a year after winning the a national year and title, six because weeks. Yeah. guess what Dabble Swinney's going to get to do every single time he visits a recruit now for the next year? Flash that ring. Flash the, yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the, guy, uh, the guys on 2018 uh, targets for Clemson. Amy, who sticks out to you as somebody that you're like, ooh, if Clemson gets that person, they are good. Well, the one that they, the big name that they have is Trevor Lawrence, the right. top cornerback in their quarterback in the class. And um, you know, we we mentioned reloading and losing Deshaun Watson. That's probably going to be the next guy there. But they have Hunter Johnson in this class right. as well, who's a really really good quarterback. So there'll be a lot of competition there. And like Bud mentioned, they've got plenty of time to flaunt that national championship. And I think with with this year's class, like we talked about, it's a small class, and they're not losing as many as many players this year so they don't have the numbers but the guys that they're losing they're really able to reload and they're losing Mike Williams and Artavis Scott but Amari Rogers and T Higgins are those guys again so uh, reloading is the goal they're doing exactly that yeah and I think 
Clemson probably has earned a fair amount of benefit of the doubt at this point for saying, <laughs> yes, we can lose top-level talent and reload with guys who maybe are younger than they would have been uh, if in a perfect world, but they can put guys in earlier and can, more often than not, it feels like those guys succeed. I, I just don't know how many times we start the beginning of the season we're like, Clemson's lost so much, and then they go out and like, yeah, we also have all these other super talented guys, so it really doesn't matter at this point. Exactly. Well, today they've unveiled their brand new facility and they have a giant slide yeah. <laughs> that looks like a blast. I'm just wondering, like, Who's, who's ACL is going to be? Listen, Ooh. don't. Let's not be negative. Gonna, let's not be negative. They, I know they, like, engineered it with, like, a nice, like, cushy landing, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just, like, if you throw a bunch of, like, I mean, giant dudes on there at one time, like... Oh, oh, it has, it has, <laughs> don't get me wrong, it has great potential for mishap. <laughs> but today is about hope. Today is about positivity. <laughs> All they have the a nap room. Dreams are coming true. Oh, I would love it. I would like a nap, a nap room. room. If yeah. Jim Bankoff is watching... Nap room. Jimmy oh, Bank. Please. All of us please, just please, had please, this please, collective, please. oh, if only okay. moment here about um, naps. Let's talk briefly about teams that you guys think are closing the day, uh, or maybe closing them in the last couple of weeks on a strong suit. Um, we've already mentioned USC. We'll talk about them a little more. Um, USC, who do, you, who do you think, there's still a lot left, Amy mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, because they're on the West Coast and a lot of their local targets aren't going to announce till later in the day. Mm -hmm. But who that they do have locked up already? Who do you guys like on this USC in this USC class? Uh, everybody. I mean, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a really loaded class. I mean, yeah. USC is going to they might close with the number three or four class yeah. in the country. Mm -hmm. They managed to land two elite level defensive tackles. I like running back Stephen Carr a lot. Bubba Bolden, a kid I got out of Bishop Gorman in Vegas. A lot of really good range with him. They pulled Levi Jones this morning out of Austin Westlake. Beat out Florida State. Beat out Florida for him. Uh, Jack Sears, their quarterback, is a, a guy that I really trust their scouting on and, and, and has nice uh, nice measurables as well. By the way, a, a coach who a lot of coaches in the business respect his quarterback evaluations, David Cutcliffe. Mm -hmm. Cutcliffe was on Jack Sears, one of the early guys, ultimately goes to USC because it's, it's very hard to say no to USC as a QB. And, and Clay Elton also looks like he can coach. Uh, which is a nice change of pace right, at right. USC after like and the not, last And not something we necessarily thought was going to be the case. I mean, when Clay after that start. got that job and had that start, <laughs> nobody was thinking like, oh, it's fine, everything's working out. Yes, that is very true. Um, yeah, they're, they're loaded. And, and looking at USC's schedule for 2017, I hope he can coach because they've got Western Michigan straight out the gate, although that's going to be you know, a very different team without P.J. Fleck. They host Stanford, they host Texas, they have to go uh, to Washington State, on a Friday night. This is all within the first half of the schedule. So there are a lot of potential, I'm not gonna say traps necessarily, but there are a lot of potential places where I can see we, the college football media, saying, oh, Clay Helton doesn't know what he, oh, oh, look at it, he's wasting his class. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily the truth, but I can already tell you how I always I knew he wasn't a good react. fit. Exactly, exactly. So <laughs> what did I tell you? If, if you go down their, their, their recruiting class rankings, yep. I'm just going to read off where these guys rank at their positions. Mm -hmm. How about 5, 4, 5, 8, 8, 6, 13, 15, 10, 2, 20. It's like a terrible poker hand. Yeah. That's what with it is. so many cards. How many cards right. do you play you poker with? That's I, like Omaha. I'm it? not a great poker player. What do you want? I hold all the cards. If you have that many did cards, I do you it? Like, and it's did still a bad. Right? Again, this is not. They a, still didn't win. This is not a gambling live show. Don't listen. I told you, all valuable information comes from YouTube, not me. <laughs> Um, I do want to talk about Oklahoma because that's another team yeah. it seems like is having a pretty good end to this recruiting cycle. Are they not? They, they are. Uh, what do you like about that class, bud? If you go comma space TX when you control F their class, <laughs> let's look at how many studs they're getting from Texas. Yeah. Bud, you're, bud, this is more like a lesson in how to troll. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're very, very sassy here. That's we're, we're trying to rope in as many brands show. as you're possible. You're right, you're right. Yeah. All right, so yeah, so we, talk, talk to me about Texas guys who are going. <laughs> okay, so hey, the Longhorns are not signing them. Who is right, signing right. them? Overwhelmingly here, Oklahoma. Chris Robinson out of Texas. Kenny Murray out of Texas. Robert Barnes out of Texas. A, a safety I really like. They got the number one, number one guard in Texas, Tyrese Robinson. C.D. Lamb out, out of Texas. They they're, they're got, what, I think 10 guys out of Texas this year? Whew. Oklahoma has not done this yeah. well in Texas since the Adrian Peterson days. Interesting. Why do you think, do you, why, why is that? I mean, I have a lot of sort of theories rolling around in my head that TCU had a down year. Mm -hmm. Baylor is, you know, experiencing a lot of baylor right now. Texas just fired a coach. Texas Tech is sort of on thin ice right now. There, there are 
there are Texas A and M sort of has this ever evolving question of do we have a good coach or do we not? It kind of depends on the week. Are they just taking advantage of sort of the fact that nobody's stable in that state right now? I think it's a perfect storm because I think all of that is true. And at the same time, we mentioned with Clemson riding the wave of the national championship next year. Right. This is an Oklahoma team that made the Final Four last right. year. Right. So I think they can really sell that to kids. Like, look, we are very competitive nationally as well. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's fair. And now they can say that they don't have to face a Tom Herman Houston team ever again. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that. Everyone's they got happy that about going that. for them. Um, anybody else that you look at and you say, okay, that school is doing what they need to do to sort of wind up this recruiting cycle? Maryland. Ooh, that's yeah. We're, we're yeah. going to talk to Maryland in a little bit. But let's let's talk about, let's before we get Alex on the phone, ugh, I didn't I didn't really expect this from Maryland this quickly. What What is it about... DJ Durkin and this staff that has clicked so clicked so well, really. I think if you contrast the energy levels of DJ Durkin with the previous coach, Randy Etzel, <laughs> they are like night and day. Yeah. And, and I think that, that's refreshing to a lot of kids. Everybody tries to, to pitch this, hey, stay home, stay home, right? Mm -hmm. but, but we saw it. We saw Kasim Hill, stay home. We saw Anthony McFarland, mm -hmm. stay home. You know, they, they got Marquise Bell out, out of New Jersey, who, by the way, wants to open a restaurant that serves Everything he told me at the Under Armour All America game. I didn't tell him Cheesecake Factory already existed, so uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll look no, for that. Uh, they, they, they get some really nice speed in Deion Jones. Uh -huh. I, they're, they're doing a nice job of getting higher level talent, and, and they have to. Yeah. Because that division is just nails, man. Yeah. Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan right. State, Penn State. And yeah, I, especially because you want to. Right now, Maryland is not in the conversation with that group. And. It's a very long road to get there, but you want to at least be considered more than being in the other part of mm. that. Because because that's the thing is there's the other side of the big. There's game. not like a really uh, comfortable middle class right now in no. that division. You are either a have or a have not. And for Maryland to be getting closer to have right now is very impressive. I will say this: it does feel like Maryland is a program that has had splashy recruits recruiting success in the past under Randy Edsel even, and just didn't do anything with those players. So it feels like the test is, can Maryland, can DJ Durkin specifically take the step Edsel couldn't, which is bring in really maybe outside of your weight class talent and actually do something. Develop them. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I think the biggest difference here that I see between, like, like you said, Edsel had signed some some big names before. I think Durkin is building better quality depth. Yeah. Right? Like, like there would be a lot of kids Maryland would take. It's like, eh, I don't know. And that's going to work be like a splashy name, Stephon right. Diggs, but right. the the gap in the class is yeah yeah okay okay. So. Well, and even today they're having a really good day. They were able to flip wide receiver Taj Capehart yep. from Virginia Tech and four star running back Cordarian Richardson picked Maryland on National Signing Day. So we're talking about the Terps on Signing Day making a splash. We're not just talking about the Terps. We're talking two one, Alex Ooh. Kirshner. How are you, buddy? Uh, how are you feeling about Maryland Signing Day? As of uh, 157 and 57 seconds. Maryland signing day has been outstanding. Um, even even better. I think the, the best thing that you were hoping for, um, if you were, uh, like me, a Terp, was that Maryland wouldn't lose anything on National Signing Day. Uh, and, in fact, Maryland has gained on National Signing Day. So it's been, it's been a really good day for them. Uh, who's the one player that you look at from this class and are most excited about watching on the field in a Maryland uniform? Well, um, if you're familiar with the recent history of Maryland football, uh, you know that uh, a few years ago they started a linebacker at quarterback for a third of the season. Um, I think that was my freshman year when I was there. Um, they haven't really had a good quarterback since, oh, I don't know. We don't, we don't need to go there. We don't need to talk about <laughs> it. But they have one now. Um, Kasim Hill, who's a four-star quarterback from St. John's College, uh, St. John's College High School in D.C., um, committed to them last spring and has stuck with it. Um, I think Bud's seen him at a couple of, of showcases over the course of the year, and he, he's really impressive. I mean, he's he's uh, come across a really good kid who also happens to have a really big uh, right arm. So I'm looking forward to to watching him and seeing what he can do there. Yeah, and uh, that seems particularly important given that you know I remember last last uh, when uh, uh, Randy Ansel was being let go, one of the biggest concerns was. Dwayne Haskins, you know, are we losing him if we get in? That's what came to pass. So it is nice to see Maryland sort of rebound from that immediate loss with a nice signing today. Um, who's the one player on the other side of that equation that you thought Maryland might or would get and didn't and 
it just stings a little bit. Uh, I think there was some hope there that they might get uh, Ellis Brooks, who's a linebacker, four-star linebacker, uh, who wound up pulling the trigger the other night for Penn State. Um, and obviously, I mean, the one the one that you could look at and say that they got away, although it's kind of tough to phrase it that way because recruiting so so weird on its face, um, is Joshua Kando, who's a five-star defensive end. Um, initially from Maryland, went to the IMG Academy, um, had been verbally committed to Maryland, and then realized, you know, I'm a five-star recruit, really a six-star recruit, if that kind of thing existed. Um, you know, I think I'm going to not go to Maryland at the end of the day. Um, he wound up going to, to Florida State, um, which is a more typical place for a player of his talent to wind up. So uh, can't really fault him for that or any recruit for going where they're going, but it would have been fun to to watch a player of that caliber on the edge from Maryland for sure. Um, big picture, you know, before we brought you on, we we're talking about how it's really critical for Maryland to have signing days like this given the division they're in. You know, looking at the numbers right now, Ohio State obviously having a fantastic signing day. Michigan, um, <clears throat> a ton of four stars, a couple of five stars. Uh, even Penn State is, you know, having looking pretty strong. How, what sort of, does Maryland have to become uh, this level of recruiting powerhouse if they ever want to be uh, in the same conversation as Ohio State and Michigan? Is there another, and is that sort of a feasible path in your mind for the Terps? Yeah, I, I don't know that there is, and that's what's kind of depressing. Um, but I think you have to look at it in a more, um, you, know, you have to look at, look at life as everything being relative. Um, I don't know if Maryland will ever win the Big Ten. Uh, I've talked about this with, with some other um, Maryland media folks. I mean, it's just really hard because you look at even uh, a year like this one where Maryland is signing absolutely the best class that it has ever signed in its history, um, and it's still going to be fourth, maybe third in the Big Ten, depending on how you view and rate Penn State. Um, Penn State, on the other hand, showed this year that anything's possible if you get on a run and um, say you beat one of Ohio State and Michigan, and then the team that you beat beats the other, and then you can win the win the league on a tiebreaker. Um, that could happen some year. Um, but, yeah, I think this is the, the bare minimum that Maryland needs for several years to even have a chance. Um, and my, as much as my heart would love to see Maryland make a run at it, I think my head tells me that even then the odds are, are not great. That, I mean, I, think, I don't think that's necessarily depressing so much as it is sort of tempered. I think it's good to approach it from – Maryland is coming right. from a very different place than Ohio State and Michigan in recent years. And if they can have a season like Penn State had this year, great. And if they don't, I still think they can show marked and sustainable improvement as a program. So I, I'm trying to talk you off the emotional ledge a little bit here. Um, last question I want to ask you before we let you go, Alex. What's the position group that you feel best about because of what Maryland was able to do uh, this in this signing cycle? Uh, they're completely loaded at running back. Um, and not that it's ever been a problem ever in the history of sports for any team to have too many good players at one position, but they really have a ton of good running backs. And I'm not sure um, how they're all going to get the ball. Um, you know, Ty Johnson uh, really emerged as a sophomore last year. Uh, Lorenzo Harrison was a freshman and had an excellent year in the backfield. Um, and then this year, you know, they added Anthony McFarland, who's a four-star from from Damatha Catholic, which is just down the road. Uh, and they added a few others. I mean, we mentioned Cordarian Richardson, who, who was a former Clemson commit, who I don't know if he's actually sent his his national letter of intent back yet, but committed there today. Um, Javon Leak from from North Carolina, they got committed there. Payon Fleet Davis, local running back, who's pretty well regarded from from Oxon Hill, Maryland. So uh, they have a ton of running backs, and they should be able to figure out. Uh, one or two or three of those guys to, to be able to tote the rock pretty effectively for a long time. That sounds extremely Big Ten football to me, and that's a good thing, Alex. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, and enjoy the rest of your signing day. Thanks, guys. Get some sleep later. Again, I don't know why they think that it's like they all, these are coworkers. They know that I have a child. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> that's why you need that nap room. I would love, again, if, we, if one thing can come out of signing day for Florida grads, Nap room. I don't, <laughs> recruiting, whatever. I can't control that. Nap room, perfect. Um, do you guys want to take some social questions? Yes. Let's do that. All right, we've got a that. few queued up. What do we got first up on the docket? All right, this is from Jim Prosser. <coughs> Does Stanford's recruiting class success give them an edge over Washington in the Pac 12 North the next few years? What do you guys think? 
I think so, absolutely. If the recruiting translates to the field 100%. Yeah. We, we've seen that over and over again. And if you recruit better, you win more. So I'm going to go with yes. And this class for Stanford is special. This is going to be something, I mean, we're not talking about it the way we often talk about really special classes, but I think we should be. Yeah. This is the counterpunch, right? Okay. Washington had mm. the, great, the great season on the field. Yep. Stanford said, hey, you forgot about us? Watch this. Right, right. Boom. Yeah. And, and so now you're going to get to see, I mean, two really good head coaches, two, two good developers of talent, and two classes that are pretty good. Washington's class is no slouch. It's a top top 20, top 25 class. You know, they've done a good job getting kids in, in their class. It, I don't think anybody has a distinct huge edge over the other. I think no. that it's setting themselves up to compete. And more importantly, if things keep going that direction at USC, whoever wins the North is going to have to be able to compete against the South in that championship game. Yeah, it, it feels like right now there is no program at all in the Pac-12 North that can wire to wire really be a force all year long. I mean, even Stanford these last couple of years, you know, the loss to Northwestern, lost to Washington last year. I mean, yes, they were super banged up. They were, Washington was playing some of the best football they played all year. But nobody can really find that gear that Oregon <coughs> was able to for years where it was just sort of like, yes, we hit the ground running mm -hmm. and we sprint all the way to the end of the season. Uh, there, I think that's really the interesting question. It's not really one totally answered by recruiting, but some of it, I think, does go to depth. Some of it goes to talent development. Um, somebody has to step up in the north because you guys are absolutely right. The way USC is looking right now, winning the Pac-12 north might start to feel like winning the SEC East, <laughs> where, hey, it's great. Oh, here's your prize. Go get your head bashed in. Right. For Congrats three on, hours. on beating people uh, that you should Oregon beat. Oregon State slash Vanderbilt. Schools that you should yeah, beat. Congratulations. Exactly. Slash it's, Vanderbilt. It's not a great time. All right, what do we got next up? Alive. All right, this is from Jack Dorsey. How nice must yeah. it be to be able to gray shirt four star recruits? I mean, he's not wrong. He's not wrong. That's very nice. Um, now, as far as gray shirting goes, I, a lot of people kind of have a negative connotation of gray shirting. Yeah. I think gray shirting is fine if you're given adequate notice. Okay. What's not fine is if you sign and then you're told, by the way, yeah. uh, you, live you, here you have to wait a semester. Right. That's not cool. Like that, it, It's all about notice. Right. And you typically want to give kid enough notice so that he can actually take a couple other official visits to schools. Like if he tells you, hey, I'm coming and I'm silently committed or I'm verbally committed out there, right. and you tell them, hey, we love you, we want you to gray shirt a semester, and you tell them that Halloween, Thanksgiving, that's fine. Yep. You still got, you know what, eight weekends taking an official visit? All for that. That's cool. That's just advance notice. I think, I, I don't know exactly how this went down because we're doing live TV, uh, but I, I hope they gave them enough notice. Okay, fair enough. I think that's sort of a parallel with when we talk about uh, guys getting offers pulled. Right. It's yep. the same sort of thing where... It happens, and if it happens in the right way, it doesn't actually screw anybody over. Right. If you wait until everybody else's class is full, it's the cruelest game of musical yeah. chairs possible. Oh, my yeah. word. Well, and, uh, you know, people say it's a business and it works both ways, and kids are always playing games and all that, but I, nine times out of ten, I'm going to defend a kid who doesn't have billion-dollar budget right. and may or may not have anything else to do with this person's whole life, whereas a school has a lot less to lose right. by you know losing out on a kid. Especially the schools that we're talking about where this happens to. Right. Where it's like, yeah, you have X other blue right. chips. And like it's not a big deal. Uh, also coaches are adults and we're dealing with high schoolers. Right. Right. Adults. And we're dealing with high schoolers. So usually I will I will posit that some coaches <laughs> are not adults. Some coaches pick no mistake. Depending on <laughs> time and place. It's I'm gonna right. defend the seventeen year old for acting like a seventeen year old and not the adult for acting like a seventeen year old. Right. Okay, you know what? You've convinced. That's me. my point. Um, we're gonna we're gonna take questions later in the show as well, so keep sending them to SBN recruiting. That is one of Bud's at least two Twitter handles. He probably has shadow Twitter handles where he starts fights with himself, if I had to guess. Five? Five? Yeah. That's real? So, no, I don't, I don't start fights. So I've got SBN Recruiting. Yeah. I've got Tomahawk Nation. Yeah. I've got Backup Tomahawk. Before Chris Thorman, shout out Chris, gave me the uh, the, like the, the limit on Twitter so I can tweet unlimited now. <laughs> I, would, I would get frozen out, so I'd have to go to the uh, Backup account. You'd be account. in Twitter jail, I've yeah. got my FSU podcast account at the Nolcast. <laughs> Uh, and then I have FSU play-by-play -play because the NCAA does not allow you to tweet live play-by-play -play during baseball games. And it also, it's really annoying to do that from your regular handle. So we set up a play-by-play <coughs> -play that our interns can use for baseball uh, during that stuff. I don't actually tweet from that anymore. It's intern only. Uh, nothing is worse than Twitter jail. I know, right? Five Twitter accounts. That's 
How many how many missed tweets have you sent? I don't think any this year. Okay. Maybe one or two last year. Okay, that's pretty good. So you just throw off your own analytics constantly right, with yeah, exactly. clicks and. Are yeah. the mutes consistent across all accounts? <laughs> uh, no, because I, I know Bud has a great mute game. I Bud do have is a great mute aggressive. game. Aggressive. He gets after it. He game plans. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I want to read that on. on. <laughs> no, we won't. It's a very detailed yeah. science, it's, especially it's, in this uh, business. It's five, six lines long. Um, so we're obviously into. Was that mine? No. <laughs> we're obviously into a weird portion of the show, and that is a good time for us to talk about weird coach stories. Recruiting season is is great because, and I'm going to piggyback off something you said, Amy, we take grown men and we make them have to woo, in some sense, teenagers. And they have to act like they know the same things about pop culture and they have to sort of like connect with them on a personal level. It doesn't happen anywhere else. It's like it's some weird Twilight recruiting. Zone... So I just, want you guys, I just want you guys to share some weird weird coach recruiting stories, however and wherever you'd like to. I mean, well, no, not wherever. Do it here. Wherever. I'm going to go. Don't, I'm going to leave and start talking like about. Don't blog post right now. I'm going to tweet them all, but I'm not going to say them right now. Um, I mean, I think Jim Harbaugh pretty much has all my favorite ones. <laughs> so good. Um, and just how he continues to make them change the rules. Right. You know, we were joking about the kindergarten day mm -hmm. and the OBGYN, but I mean, you know, they're going they're going to Rome. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's not that's not as, as funny, uh, but I think to me some of my favorites from this year is the, the go-kart with Aubrey Solomon uh, and his little sister mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, hanging out in the go-kart and then um, jumping in the pool with Oliver Martin when uh, Oliver committed to Michigan. So I think he just, he, this man has more energy than anyone I've ever seen. And I think he just has a way of continuing to make his name relevant all year long. I look forward, he's inevitably going to like break a hip or something doing one of these. It, oh yeah, <laughs> I was wrestling with a recruit and he oh, you know, yeah. just popped right out. Well, he'll be on WWE probably one of these days yeah. too, right? Is he like a huge fan? <laughs> yeah. Too. Catch him and then he'll be on Judge Judy, his BFF, <laughs> suing whoever yes. broke his hip. <laughs> you guys will do almost anything to to get a recruit, yeah. right? I mean, legal, obviously. <clears throat> right. When, when, when Urban Meyer left Florida the first time, he talked about how you know he realized he had to kind of check himself because he was checking his, his text messages in church, right? Like that was you know <laughs> the, this is an intense game. Nick Saban will dance. Not well, but he'll, he'll right. do it. He'll Cupid shuffle, yep. he'll, he'll dab. Uh, cha cha slide, he'll dab, yeah. Um, you know Nick Saban loves I, dancing. <laughs> my favorite one, uh, if you follow these kids on Instagram or Snapchat, they'll, they'll like, hey, coach, will you take a selfie with me? And right. these coaches are hip enough because they understand what a selfie is. Right. But they don't realize that the kid is actually Snapchatting video of them. <laughs> so, so they're holding it up, and the coach is like, and he's like right. what's wrong? <laughs> So oh, the coach, kids, it's a video. The, the kids prank him like that. They don't tell it's a video. It's great. Oh, that well, that happens so to Rihanna, funny. too. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> if coaches are as cool as Rihanna, I don't even know the world that we live in. Well, and speaking of really, really awkward videos, I think my favorite thing this year is Lane Kiffin's uh, They pulled that down. Hype. They, they pulled, they pulled that oh, video no. down. I mean, oh. it's the internet, so what obviously an exciting it's not time. gone. Well, but, well. Boy, yeah, Lane. Oh, man. I don't want to put it all on Lane Kiffin. No, it's totally not his fault. It, I disagree with that. It's somewhat his fault. Part but, of it's his fault. But but it's not like, uh, may, I assume, I assume Lane Kiffin didn't, like, set up a camera, mic himself <laughs> up, and say, all right, we're going to shoot this video. You don't think I don't this is his idea? I don't sun. think so. Yeah, I'm going to make sure that the sun is We got really good lighting? Yeah, that, I'm look very like, bright. Look like I slept in my car after a bender. Forego buttoning any of the buttons. Right, yeah. right. But... Oh man! If Here's my point with this one, though. We yeah. would, if that was a normal video, I don't know if we would be talking about it. Fair. So the fact that it was just so that is odd. I think to... it's we're talking about it. I don't want to pull it down because that's almost like you're apologizing for it. Now and now we can't Kevin enjoy. Th Kevin never apologize. Never. <laughs> He yeah. does a lot of interesting things to keep us talking about him. We're talking about him, and we wouldn't have if it was just like very exciting and enthusiastic. It's. Ugh. So I got one. Okay. I, got, I got to remove the names on this because I still, have, I still yeah. have to deal with these people. But <laughs> several Please years do. ago, <laughs> they're laughing because they've already heard me tell it in production. There was a uh, pretty highly rated four-star, maybe five-star kid on, on some networks who was committed to a school with good academic standards. And a coach from another school was recruiting him. And the kid wanted to go to this other school, or so the coach thought. And the kid's grades weren't that good. And so one night, the coach... And the two coaches recruiting him primarily knew each other. And the one coach got 
liquored up or maybe a little, a little intoxicated and calls the other coach and says, hey, look, you know this blank is too dumb to get into your school. Why are you still messing around with him? Let him decommit and come to us. <laughs> Because his mom was the one that wanted them to go to this school. Yeah. Well, the problem was that was a voicemail, oh, <laughs> which wow. got played yeah. for the kid, and the kid that went. Was... To, the kid actually ended up qualifying, <laughs> and, is, and is now in the NFL. So it was an inspirational story. It was. He inspired him to boost his craft. Happy ending. And the coach who left the voicemail lost his job a year or two later. Okay. So yeah. That's. I yeah. don't know why you give fuel to the fire of someone you're recruiting against. Right. Yeah. I think it was just because like, you know, hey, we're buddies and maybe we're not. No, this is sound the game. Right now. There's no holds yeah. bar on this on recruiting. We, so we know this. Let's. I, I do, bud. I'm gonna say a phrase, and I just want to get your reaction to it. Negative recruiting. Everybody does it. Yeah. Nobody will, will admit to it. Okay. Um, but there's a difference between making up lies. Yeah. And what I would like to call comparative recruiting. Okay. Right. You have to showcase how you are different than another school. You have to right. differentiate your Otherwise, product. there's no point. Right. Otherwise, like, you'll love, you know, the state school, come to the state. You know, no, you, you got to be comparative. What you don't want to do is go super negative, and you don't want to lie to kids because then maybe another staff gets word of that. They stop at a Kinko's. They print out your real depth chart as opposed to the one you showed them at home, and then the kid thinks you're a liar and can't trust you and doesn't sign with you. That happened last year, too. Okay. By the way. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, I mean, I think that th what sticks out to me about negative recruiting is – you can't lean on it so heavily that you're not also selling your school. Right. Right. Because maybe you'll see it and this recruit won't go to the school that you're negatively recruiting against. It doesn't mean he's gonna, you're going to sign him. Right. Maybe he's going to a different rival of yours. And maybe you've just made their class better, which they're not paying you to do that. <laughs> As it turns out. Well, and, and these kids, they do see through a lot of that stuff. Right. I mean, a lot of them, that is a good sales pitch. But I remember there are so many kids that I talked to throughout the years that said, I picked this school because throughout the process, they never talked bad about anyone else. And mm -hmm. that's what really stood out to me. So right. I knew that I could trust these coaches. Right. Right. So that actually can backfire depending on the kid. Yeah, yeah. Um, how, much, how much of this do you think... You know, as we said at the top of the show, recruiting, signing day rather, has become a little more stale. But they're all guys who they go through the whole thing. They, you know, they bring out the hats. How many recruits at this point do you think are getting to this stage in the process and really are not that sure about where they're going to go? If the people that we are seeing, the kids that we're seeing recruit today, or commit today rather, are they just sort of confirming something they've known for weeks? Or are there still kids who are like, yeah, I don't know, and I kind of have to make a decision, and I think it's going to be this one? This this year seems to me less less of that than normal. I mean, of course, we have Marvin Wilson tweeting this morning. Oh, I'm having some second thoughts. Now, it, this man's Twitter handle is also Hollywood Marv, so I don't know how much I would put stock into that. But sure. I mean, I remember throughout the years, like being on the phone with guys at midnight, 2 a.m. the night before signing day, trying to get my commitment stories in advance, and them still being like, I I don't know what I'm doing, or I'm arguing with my mom about what right. I'm doing. Yes. There's a lot of that that used to happen. I don't know if that's as much anymore especially because we talked about the, all the early enrollee guys. But what's your vibe for this year? They know where they want to go. Okay. That's fair. They don't know where they're going to end up because, like you said, mom's got to agree a lot of times. Okay. You know, A lot of the kids, you know, they, they try to call it Florida, right? And we're both from Florida. We, we cover recruiting in Florida. Hey, I'm going to go to Oregon. That's a good September line. Right. Come February, where do you go? Probably <laughs> probably not something that's going to cost the parent $1,500 round trip, right? right? right. So, and, 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 you know, you got to take off work Friday where does mom want you to go? Where does dad want you to go? Do you have an uncle or a trainer, especially if they're extra shady? Because they might have some input on where you might go to school. Uh, you know, where, where does your high school coach want? But I think in their heart, most of the kids know where they want to go. And also, the, the does that school have space for you? Think? Right. There are definitely some kids who will put their recruitments and their uh, announcements later on in the day to, see to, to depth chart shady. watch. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Yep. yep, that makes sense. Um, the other part about committing to Oregon when it's not February is there's an obvious temperature. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right, let's talk Especially to a man who is always warm. Oh, I Cam, see what you did there. It's seamless, just seamless. Cam Underwood of State of the U, I assume, is perfectly warm and comfortable today. How is your signing day going, buddy? Um, I'm very warm and comfortable as I have this lovely patio window door open. Uh, and my signing day is going, uh, it's going good, not great, but, you know, uh, could be better, you know, but we're fine. What's been the highlight uh, in your mind for Miami fans today? 
Uh, the highlight today was getting both four-star receivers, Mike Harley from local St. Thomas Aquinas and Jeff Thomas, the breakout star of the Under Armour All-American game from East St. Louis, um, Illinois. Both of those guys committed today, giving us the speed that Mark Rick has been looking for for two years at receiver. So that has to be the highlight. What, and, and then you mentioned it's been good but not great. What have been the disappointing elements uh, from a Miami perspective? Well, unfortunately, we lost a couple guys to your alma mater, uh, Ryan, uh, the University of Florida, that we were battling for in four-star cornerback Chris Henderson from Miami Columbus and three-star from uh, Miramar High School, Brian Edwards. So both of those guys decided to go to Florida instead of coming here to Miami. So we've added a, a few guys, but not everybody. So like I said, good but not great. Well, I mean, think of it this way. You, you know, you're always fond of saying that Florida's scared of Miami. And if you don't want to play Miami, you can't play against other Miami players on your team. So it really just makes sense that Gainesville is the place for them. That way they can avoid the Hurricanes at all possible costs. Um, who are you looking at from this signing class, not necessarily from guys who committed today? Uh, who's one person that stands out and you say, that's somebody who is going to do amazing things uh, for the U? Uh, amazing things in general or this year? Let's say in general. I don't want to necessarily put you on the spot for this year. I mean, it's fine. For me, I got to stick with quarterback because it's the most important position on the field. And the number one guy at quarterback and in this recruiting class for Mark Richt was Nikosi Perry from Ocala Vanguard High School. Um, Four-star recruit. He can run. He can throw. He does it all. Um, we made the comparison on the website today that he's basically Marcus Mariota uh, part 2.0. Uh, and we have video and analysis on that. And like I said, he was the number one player on Mark Rick's board. Uh, we have an opening at quarterback because Brad Kai went to the NFL. So it might be this year. I would like it to be this year. But if not in the future, I think Nikosi Perry is going to be a name that people are going to know across this country. What's your perspective now that this now that we've gone through two signing days with Mark Rick? How do you feel about how he stacks up to Miami head coaches as recruiters of, let's say, recent years? I know this is not necessarily... Uh, the not Miami classes that we look, saw a, further back, but if we're looking at his more recent competition, would you say Mark Richt is more success, about the same? How is he different, really? I would say that he's more successful. This would have to be our best recruiting class since that legendary 2008 recruiting class yep. where they got, you know, basically the entire Miami Northwestern uh, high school team to come onto the, the, the U that year. Uh, so we're doing a lot better with the local guys, you know, Navon Donaldson, Kylie on Herbert, um, you know, Mike Harley, other guys from Florida and South Florida that we should be getting um, and just upping our game. So, you know, this year we're right around that. 10-11 rank uh, on most of the recruiting services, and that's up from what previously happened. Last year's class, when he took, Mark Rick took over for Al Golden, there was a lot of top-end talent. Those are your freshman All-Americans, your Shaq Corden, Shaq Corderman, Mike Pinckney, Amon Richards, but overall, this class is getting back to what a Miami class should be. Um, like I said, there were some misses, obviously, those guys who went to Florida, the whole Anthony McFarland thing, when pretty much everybody had it on good authority that Anthony McFarland had told the coaching staff he was coming to Miami until he announced and all of a sudden he wasn't. Yeah. So that was a miss there. But other than that, I think things are going in the right direction. And, you you know, you get burned once and you get twice shy. So next year, I don't think we're going to have those same kind of failings when you kind of trust the kid implicitly like we did with McFarland. But this is definitely a step forward. Um, if you, other than quarterback, I will limit you there. Uh, if there's one position group that you look at and you say, okay, that's one that's going to be asked to step up sooner maybe than uh, we would have expected or than might be optimal. Uh, from this class in particular, which one is it? It has to be the cornerbacks because we're losing so many um, off of the roster and from the top of the roster, guys like Adrian Colbert and Corn Elder. I'm sorry, second-round NFL draft pick Corn Elder because he's going to be a second-round draft pick. <laughs> but when you lose guys like that, you have to replace them. Right. And some of those Al Golden specials, those developmental guys who have not been able to develop because they're just not that good. You know, you, these kids who are in this class now, Javante Dean, a Juco kid who's from Homestead, Trajan Bandy from Miami Columbus, who's a teammate of Chris Henderson, who chose Florida like, you know, he shouldn't have, but whatever. Those guys are going to have to play from day one. And I, neither of them are going to be early enrollees, but they're going to have to step up. And that's just plain and simple because we don't have the depth there. And they have the talent to play, and we're going to need them to play and play in a big way.
Um, Cam, I would be remiss if I did not offer <coughs> you a opportunity to get a closing shot at Bud, if you would like to, if you have anything you'd like to say to Bud before we let you go. Yeah, tell me my head looks like a thumb, like all your Miami fan friends. <laughs> But he's a jerk. I can't stand him. No, he, he's actually a good guy. He was supposed to come down for this recruiting event a couple of weeks ago so we could go out and have chicken and beer together, but he, he stiffed me on that one. So, But it was for the U.S. Army All-American game. But, no, he, he's a good guy. He does good work when he's not trying to troll Miami fans, so I don't really have anything bad to say. I mean, he's almost always trying to troll Miami fans, but I will say... <laughs> Whatever power I have vested in me here at SB Nation, I decree that Bud owes you chicken and beer. You're welcome. Yes! I love it. Thank you, Ryan. No problem. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Cam. I'll see you in a month, buddy. Thanks for joining us, Cam. All right, man. Um, let's the pivot. developmental special. That was a good one. <laughs> listen. listen. <laughs> Whatever you got to do. Uh, why, you can't have boring guests. That's why we have Cam. No way. No, it's great. You can. Okay, well, you shouldn't. We shouldn't. <laughs> we That's what we're trying not to do. Um, Let's pivot to, you know, my, I think Miami's had a, a pretty nice recruiting season overall um, and is starting to get back to where certainly Miami fans would like to see them. Um, let's talk about something a little bit more depressing. Um, Ole Miss's class. Ooh. Yeah. I think that reaction sort of says it all. Hold on, it's going to take a second to okay, scroll down here. Scroll. Uh, I literally have R.I.P. Ole Miss here in my notes. <laughs> oh, got it. That's not how I want to feel. It's I, never good if you have to click the See More tab. Uh, oh, boy. Um, yeah, I. how many four stars are in this class? Two? Two. Two four stars in this class. Um, I was thinking about this earlier today, and... Just that splash that that, what was it, 2013 or 2014, the, the Robert Kimdichie. The 2013 class, well. yeah, yeah, the number four class in the country. Right, I like that was the class, and I think when we think like, oh yeah, Ole Miss recruiting, they're like really doing well, it's kind of like that is stuck in our memory right. as like, this was something that changed the game, and right. I don't think that that's happened. And it's looking more like outlier. Than right, I think that's kind of my, my take on it uh, right now, looking at. Looking at all this, we do. Bud was kind enough to help us put together this card. This is the this is part oh, of the old class. That's clever, old misses. Uh, uh, that is so clever. But looking at this list, how how much how big of a boost would it have been if Old Miss had been able to close even two of these guys? You know, I, I really think they could have signed. They could have swept these guys had there not been this NCAA cloud. Right. Right. Yeah. I, what ha needs to happen at Old Miss? Cam Akers lo losing the the best running back since. Uh, the guy they made the 30 for 30 about, uh, Marcus Dupree, yep. to come out of Mississippi. Yep. Walker Little, whose brother <coughs> is, is at Ole Miss, who go, went to Stanford. Jacob Phillips, who L LSU flipped, a great linebacker. Willie Gay, a linebacker who just last year, o Ole Miss pulled a kid out of that same high school, even though it's in, it's in Starkville. The NCAA -like cloud of uncertainty, I'm going to argue here, is worse than what the sanctions will be. Okay. Because once they get the actual sanctions to come down, whatever they are, and I don't think they're going to be that bad, mm -hmm. then... Other schools can stop lying about what they're going to be. Right now, if I'm an opposing school, I can tell you that they're going to get the death penalty. Right. And while you can say that's not reasonable and that is not going to happen, you can't tell me that we didn't get the death penalty, right? Because it hasn't happened yet. Mm. The, 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 the weight, I think, has been worse than the punishment will be. And I think it's also the, um, the unclear timeline of it is yes. so hard because it's one thing if you can say, okay, I know... In a year, we will know what's going to happen. But it's sort of like right. next week something could happen. It could be two months. It could be a year. I mean, and, you know, we just talked to Cam. Miami has sort of dealt with this, this sort of thing where the investigation seems to take more away from you than the actual punishment. The does. Tunzel uh, thing on draft night right. yeah. Um, yeah. has kind of reset the clock on that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they, they need to get that done and out of the way so that they, they, they can sign a full class and have some certainty as to what they can offer in terms of scholarships. And they could tell kids... Hey, are we going to get a bowl man or not? Mm -hmm. At least we know. Yeah, uh, the uncertainty is always worse than the actual actual sanctions are, and we see this yeah. with schools every time they're Absolutely. under investigation. And because we talk about negative recruiting, you know that's what coaches are bringing up when they're recruiting against Ole Miss. Right, and it doesn't hurt that the media can do it for them because anytime <laughs> there's any sort of movement on Ole Miss and the NCAA, we're all writing about it and tweeting about it. There's probably 40 or 50 uh, media members out there who, who would do that. Maybe, maybe closer to 40. Bias. <laughs> the media yeah, bias. That's what it is. Well, and we're going back to that 2013 class. This is, this is you know, they're, they're paying for it now. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Um, from what you guys know talking to recruits, how much, I mean, it feels like it can't just be 
the cloud, though. There are, Ole Miss has definitely not maximized the talent that they had with those guys. You know, you look at you look at the other teams from 2013 uh, that had these monstrous recruiting classes. This Ole Miss class uh, ends up going <clears throat> 32 and 19 over four years, 24 and 14 over three. It's not great. I mean, th- those are fine numbers, but there is some on-field element to this too, as well. There has to be. It feels like. Well, and you almost feel like it. it- it's better than that. Right. Like reading the numbers now, I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's true. Right. Like they definitely underperformed. But uh, perhaps beating Alabama a few times kind right. of gives you this perspective it's... that, oh, th- this team is actually doing better than you than you think it is. Exactly. I mean, it, this is a team that went to the Peach Bowl. Mm-hmm. We won't talk about what happened. They went to the Sugar Bowl and, and, and won. They're, what, they go five and seven this year? Their five and seven season could not have happened at a worse time. Right. Yeah. You, you yeah. combine the cloud <laughs> with the most disappointing season that Hugh Freeze has had. Yeah. In a year where they absolutely had to get some answers at linebacker, they, they got one in Breon Dixon. You know, they, they, they needed a receiver. They definitely needed a running back after they missed out on Cam Akers. I think their pursuit of Cam Akers possibly cost them Ty Chandler, right, who ended up at Tennessee. Ty Chandler, who had an old Miss connection. But, you know, at that point it was too late in the game because they were all in on Cam Akers. And it, it can't not be. Right. The best player in your state in probably 25, 30 years. Uh, so it was just kind of a perfect storm of stuff that they didn't, didn't need to have happen that, that happened and that's why their class is, is outside the top 35 as yeah. we speak. Yeah, especially when you look at, I mean, you go back through the losses to Florida State and Alabama. Those were two, I mean, even if you say keep everything else the same, this is a 7-5 and five team, a 7-5 right. and 7 team, A, those are two real nice heads to mount on your wall, and B, the blowing those leads. Yeah. Just, just it, I, I feel maybe this is just a very amateur opinion. It leaves a very bad taste in your mouth in terms of the coaching staff, in terms of like, how many coaching staffs would be able would would be able to blow big leads on these teams? That just ugh, yeah, that's just really rough. Um, but we'll say you know I th- it was not that long ago that I don't think we we would have been shocked to even talk about Ole Miss as having a disappointing recruiting class in terms of expectations being super high in the first place. So maybe that's the positive way to look about it. Ugh, that didn't go great. Um, <laughs> Let's show you a little bit of SB Nation research here. This is, and finally we get to break up. Oh, I've been waiting for this moment. Uh, This is the five-star desert. Mm. Uh, As you can see here, Bud, can you explain to us what we're looking at here? Oh, sure. I'm going to eat this. Uh, All right, so what we're looking at here on the screen is uh, compiled by Alice Kirshner. This is something I was playing around with, and then he actually took and is better at graphics than I am and and made this, and an awesome job by Alex. There are in this this area that we've outlined. There are no five-star recruits this year at the high school level, and that is uh, over two million square miles. You might point out that a lot of that contains uh, the Rocky Mountains, which they don't play high school football on top of mountains. But yeah, that's true, and still not a lot of talent there. And you also don't have a whole lot of teams that consistently win national titles in this range either. You get you know kind of along the edges. You got Oklahoma and Texas. There are normally some more five stars there, but. You know, there's kind of a two million square mile uh, thing here. We, we dubbed the five star desert, and it's just this is why college football is so static because the talent really does not move around a whole lot. It's not like one year the South is good, right. next year the West, and then next year South Dakota's loaded. Well, and and it's also not like the NFL draft where you're just like, oh, it's my turn. I get to pick whoever I want. But if you, I mean, if you're the school there, kind of works out for you. Uh, we're also having five star dessert. Five star desert. Very clever. Five star desert. These big <laughs> chocolate chip cookies. That's gonna sound. I good. just really wanted a cookie, so I came up with a clever pun That's for right. the Amy, dessert this, desert. Amy, Amy made this happen. We <laughs> that. Um, this <laughs> also. <laughs> oh, these are fantastic. Oh my word! That is um, a good cookie. This also, if you look at this map, though, it also sort of explains why we talk about certain schools mm-hmm. as being behind the eight ball. I mean, I will say. It is nice for Oklahoma that they were able to raid Texas so well, considering mm-hmm. they're in this territory. But you look at some of the other uh, folks that are in here. I mean, Nebraska is having a very good mm-hmm. recruiting day as well, but they are un- un- undoubtedly hampered by the fact that they're pretty much smack dab in the middle of this right now. But you can also look at this, I think, the other way. Colorado, Utah, two schools that Colorado this year had a fantastic year. Utah has consistently done well. And the one that really sticks out to me is Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Wisconsin is a team that, um, as of now, uh, I feel like, yeah, they're 47. Uh, Wisconsin hasn't had a particularly notable signing day in a long time. Mm-hmm. Wisconsin just wins, man. They, they, they are able to take the players that they do have and the players that they're able to get 
and get, you look at some of the people, some of the schools that are ahead of them on this signing day list as of now, you're looking at Rutgers and Arizona and Arizona State. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like Wisconsin is the school that stands out the most right now as, you know, I'm not going to say recruiting rankings don't matter because that's not true. Yeah. But Wisconsin manages to win despite the fact that they do. Is that right. a fair statement? Yes, and I think if you look at it, recruiting rankings are more accurate at the top. Because if I'm a ratings agency, what am I going to catch more flack for if I screw up? A five-star rating or some three-star? There's like 30-something five-stars every year. There's like 1,200 three-stars. Nobody's going to point out and say, how could you rate that kid a three-star? He should have been a two-star. But if a five-star bust, your Twitter's going to light up. Right. So... Yeah, I, I do think that there is more variance between your two and threes, and the scouting, I think, matters more at that level than it does at the five-star level. Like, I could take anybody in the video production department out there that's never done any scouting and go out and they could say, that looks like a five-star to me. That guy that's 6'6", you know, <laughs> six, six, 300, it's moving faster than the yeah. guy 50 pounds lighter than him. Right. So you look at where, where is the value of scouting the greatest? If you're a school like, like Alabama, it's probably in the last five kids in your class, mm -hmm. how you differentiate between your fours and your threes you're going to yeah. sign. Mm -hmm. If you look at Wisconsin, you got to fill out a whole, uh, the vast majority of your class as sleepers, and they yeah. do that. We, we've seen uh, – who was the kid they took out of South Florida, the, the uh, short DB a couple of years ago? Um, you know what I'm talking uh, about? I can picture his face. Talked constantly. Is that helpful? It, it ended up being really, really good. Yeah. I, 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 I ambushed Amy with that question. I can picture his face. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they – Kansas State does the same thing. They really do a good job of finding kids. Can you scout your way to a national title? No. Can you scout your way to eight or nine wins in the Big Ten or the Big 12? I think so. Yeah. It's 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 very impressive. Sojourn Shelton. Yes. There we go. I remember it. I wanted to say Stanford Samuels. That's what was in my head. So all the S's of South Florida DBs. Wisconsin wishes he was a, a two-star. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but we also, I mean, yeah. the good news is also if you look at that map, once the oceans rise three feet, that's going to be prime recruiting territory. Yeah, that, that's that will be. Everyone will be. Yep. Oh. Sorry, Florida oh. schools. Another, we all went to one. It's fine. Another. Um, like it. um, another bite of the cookies. Let's go somehow sorry. to a more, even more ridiculous thing. <laughs> the top ten lies you're going to tell yourself on not just this signing day, but every. So signing this is my favorite day. thing. Um, we're just going to count them down for you. Let's start with number ten. We didn't want that recruit in the first place. Every time. It never fails. You know, we offered him. We visit, we had him visit. We gave him swag. But we really didn't want him. If he commits, it was all he's, the best, he's the best. We're the best. And if he decommits, oh, well, we just we, we decided to move we on. We didn't want him. That was really us. It wasn't this kid rejecting nine. us. Uh, this one stinks for me. <laughs> uh, our four-star athlete just needs a year of coaching. And voila, we got ourselves a quarterback. I can't. How often does this actually happen? I how can't. often does this work? Uh, how often do fans say it? Very often. <laughs> <laughs> how often do, do they actually? Uh, not, not, not as often. It's um, not. I'm it's not sure I can fun. actually think of like two examples of that actually working. Okay. Yeah. I, Auburn has done decent with that idea. Yeah. yeah. Decent. Nick Marshall. Yeah, I would say Nick Marshall is really the only one that's coming to my mind. Cool. So it's definitely going to work out for you. It'll definitely, yes. Number eight. Rival University is cheating significantly more than my school is. I'm glad at least that this one kind of has the admission of like my school is cheating. Right. Though. <laughs> but only, but only but like less than the rival school is cheating. Right. Like the level. In a classier way. It's sort of like listen, we all have to cheat to sort right. of do the base level. You ain't but cheating, you ain't there's trying, a gentlemanly right? level of cheating, and then there's what they do. And that is too far. That stack of beast gift cards is far too high. <laughs> too far. Um, number seven. <clears throat> He's only a two-star because he's not in our strength program yet. Yeah, they just got to add some meat on, uh -huh. add some meat yep, on that bone. Just got to get Bulk him up a little bit. Yep. Get him in there. Yep, and then that's how it works. Number six, recruiting rankings are flawed, biased, meaningless anyway. This, is, this probably should have been our number one. It's the number uh, one thing we hear, I uh -huh. think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So there are a few reasons why I think that one persists in particular. Number one, Tom Brady. Tom Brady is absolutely <laughs> he is totally responsible for this. Although Tom Brady <coughs> also proves that the NFL draft doesn't matter, right? Yeah. Yep. So, and it's significantly tougher to scout high school kids, I think, because guess what? They're still growing. Yeah, they change. 
college guys are, are pretty much done growing. I yeah. love how just every year, like in the college football national, every major event, national championship, Super Bowl, whatever, we always have these big long stories of like, they have they have 23 uh, one stars starting on their team, yeah. and stars yeah. don't measure heart. Don't let anyone tell you any different, kids. Was, <laughs> the, the national media that doesn't cover recruiting always weighs in this time of year, and I read an article today that said Ben Bolwer was not heavily recruited. I was like, <laughs> yeah, if you meet 20 offers, and, and like by the time he was a junior, yeah. Yeah. Yes, he was. He was the top player in South Carolina. And Hunter Renfro caught the touchdown pass for Clemson. Right. Do you know who Bama was covering? Probably five-star Deion Kane, <laughs> five-star Mike Williams, four-star Tay Scott, thrown by five-star Deshaun Watson, blocked for by uh, four-star right tackle and five-star left tackle Mitch Hyatt. Yeah. Who you, I'm probably going to leave the two-star uncovered. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty good. But the, the, yeah. the little guys make it all go around. Uh, number five. Kansas State has two stars. Kansas State <laughs> wins. We have two stars. Ergo facto, we're going to win. Now, Kansas State is the other thing that does <coughs> throw this off. That's just because Bill Snyder is say, a you don't wizard, have Bill right? Snyder. Yeah. That's the only possible answer. Um, number four. I like this one a lot. Our JUCO signees have unique heartwarming <laughs> stories. <laughs> Rival use JUCOs are bad people. Oh my gosh, this is so hard. This bad, is so true. Terrible. <laughs> I can't even, just because it's so... <laughs> <laughs> off the field uh, issues. Off the uh-huh, field issues. Uh-huh. We wrote this years ago, and it's our still guys, so true. Our guys are maturing. Overcoming all our odds. Our guys are overcoming adversity. Those guys, <laughs> career criminals. Number three. <laughs> I'll try and pay less attention to recruiting next year. Oh, my gosh. This, I, nobody's ever successful. Nobody has done this. If you're interested in recruiting, you're interested. It's just how it works. Number two. Most of these signees and our head coach will still be here. <laughs> In four years. It's, yeah. Did we mention Ole Miss? Um, number one. My tweets at recruits matter. Oh, my gosh. My tweets at recruits matter. Oh, oh my goodness. I, I, I'll tell you how this they actually might matter is that I've heard multiple kids say, I am not going to school XYZ mm-hmm. because the fans were so mean to me on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> so they matter in a sense of deterring someone from coming to your school. Yeah. I just. <laughs> I just. Can you imagine tweeting at a high school kid trying to convince him to go to your alma mater? Like no. relentlessly. I mean, some of these people, like, I think they schedule these tweets. There's no way they're up and at their computer this often. They may, they may have, like, some social media. Well, I on. just, what's confusing about it is Twitter, Twitter has been around long enough in the recruiting era that you can't look at it and say, if, if you're a kind of person who does this, you can't say, oh, that worked. At some point, <laughs> wouldn't you just give up and try something else? Of all the crazy, oh, oh, no, it's just. I know. What's <laughs> worse here, these, these fans will find out the kids' Instagram handles. And now they have like Instagram Live, and so you can do a live broadcast on your Insta. And the kid is like talking about like some stuff and like talking to his friends. And then you see all of a sudden like somebody <laughs> will post on a message board and vroom, you know. R- RTR, come to Tennessee, and like, like, the, like the scroll of fans is just going crazy, oh and the kid's God. like, oh, well, it looks like the, the football fans found it, so I'm going to shut this down Do you now. think you realistically could create a fake recruit that people would tweet at? Yes. Yes. And that would be so easy. 100%. <laughs> Absolutely, that would be so easy. Georgia has like half a million counties. We just put like, like, a, like one of the real small ones. Yes. That's why there's no photo of them. Yes. Oh, yeah. that would be way too easy. Mm. I really want to do this. This is food like, for thought. I really for next want to year. do this now. Um, this is a project for next year. As a reminder, we are taking your questions. We're not doing it yet, but send them in now. Tweet them at SBN Recruiting. Um, we're winding down. We only got a little bit left in the show. What are we going to call our fake kid? I'm gonna let. We're going to figure that one out. I'm going to start dreaming That's about. It's got to be something country to go with our, our Georgia County. That's true. Like Walker. I'm already. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk now Sanders. to Dan Davis <laughs> of our LSU blog and the Valley Shook. Dan, welcome to the program. <coughs> how are you doing? And how are you feeling on this, the most momentous of signing goals? Feeling really good. It's been a really good day for LSU so far. What's been the highlight uh, in your mind so far for the Tigers? Well, easily getting Chase on out of Texas, getting him from Houston is the, is the big win of the day so far. There's some more to come that... LSU fans are waiting on, but that's the one that kind of came as a shock overnight. I think most people thought he was going to go to Texas as of late last night and this morning kind of wake up and all the crystal balls shifted our way. Um, It's also been a pretty nice day defensive back-wise for LSU. That's probably the least 
uh, surprising thing anybody has ever said. What can you tell us about the guys in the secondary uh, that's, that have committed to LSU today? Well, it's led by Jacoby Stevens, five safety <laughs> out of Nashville. Uh, absolute stud. Probably has a chance to start or at least contribute right away with Jamal Adams leaving for the NFL. Uh, but then you got other guys like Kerry Vincent and Todd Harris jumping in there. Um, and then a, an underrated guy from Louisiana, John Trey Kirkland, that I really like. He's a really good athlete, a little smaller, but uh, we tend to pluck these guys out of small towns in Louisiana, and then you've never heard of them, and all of a sudden, you know, they're the next Thorpe Award winner. So we're feeling pretty good about the total haul there. Um, is there any position that you look at and you say, eh, I kind of wish we had gotten one or two more guys or one guy in particular? Uh, what's sort of the, the part of the cupboard that still could use a little filling if you're LSU? Yeah, I mean, we're waiting on Marvin Wilson, who's announcing this later this afternoon. And then you got Devonta Smith, the wide receiver. So those, you know, Wilson at DT would be uh, a really cherry on top of this class. If there's one position they really struck out on, it's probably running back because they kind of went all in on Cam Akers, uh, who ended up going to Florida State, and now they're left with a three-star kid that I really like, smaller kid, um, sort of built like Maurice Jones-Drew, just a small, bulky kid. But, you know, they, there's not a lot of depth, you know, in terms of top-tier athletes that running back after Darius Geis at LSU. So uh, kind of a missed opportunity there to add a player that would be that sort of natural uh, heir apparent. Um, one thing that sticks out to me is that, you know, as we let go of the Les Miles era, uh, it's it's got to be a little bit different covering recruiting now for LSU and sort of watching it from a distance. What do you think is, uh, is the biggest shift in your mind uh, from a recruiting standpoint for Ed Orgeron from what LSU has been doing for what feels like forever? Yeah, it's super weird. Like 12 years, I think it's been since we've had a new coach doing our national signing day presser today. Um, the biggest shift I think is that in most years, miles really like to have kind of all the hay in the barn. And then you maybe have like one or two announcements on signing day and sort of just be done with it. Yep. Um, Ogeron has gone a little more flashy. We've had a ton of players. I think we had up to six spots. We were looking to fill the day. So I think he's playing that waiting game, looking for that big last national splash, get the attention, get the attraction, get the excitement, uh, which is a little different than Miles, who, you know, in every possible way is more conservative and reserved. So um, it's also been weird to watch him on TV today, and he put on a Nebraska hat, and he's wearing red, which is all bizarre for LSU fans. Yeah, that's... I don't feel comfortable about that at all. <laughs> uh, last question, and I you can't say Cam Akers for this one. Who is the commit that LSU didn't get today that you were hoping and dreaming of and now will have to, unfortunately, watch play in a different uniform? Marcavius Bryant, but I talked about him earlier. Um, it seemed like all the momentum had shifted to us and that the batting odds were on him. And then he picked Auburn, which didn't even seem like the second choice. So it was a very strange – I think LSU fans kind of had this fantasy of like, oh, we're going to get Bryant and Chason and have this like – dominant pass rushing duo and then they strike out on bright completely when everyone was feeling good about him so he's the big miss of the day uh but you know like i just said you get chase on you feel a lot better because you still got one of those top tier rushers fair enough uh dan thanks so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your signing day yeah thanks guys take care um what do you guys think about lsu's class this is when i mean i know bud you've sort of watched this and there's been a lot of questions about what Coach O is able to do as a recruiter in the full-time job, but now that we're coming to the end of his his first class, success, failure, mixture, what do you guys think? I, I think it's a success. Look, why do you hire Coach O? Recruiting, because you want to get that talent level up. And LSU's always had talent, but you want to get it up. You, you want the player development, but it's not like people are going to think Coach O is going to come in and be like a scheme genius, right? right. He's a career defensive line coach who's been an elite recruiter for you know a couple decades in the SEC. They did a great job, though. I mean, Jacoby Stevens is the most athletic safety in the country. They also got Grant Delpit. I mean, that's the best safety combination, sorry, USC fans, in the nation. Uh, Austin DeCoolis, I think, is a guy you can plug in immediately uh, at guard or tackle. A big kid they, they got out of Texas. And, you know, I know Amy can talk about this, too. Quarterback. LSU has seemingly had a little bit of a quarterback issue uh, in, in recent years. Like, it seems like they're... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like sometimes I'm not really sure they're playing with so one. So kind of you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they got two. <laughs> Nine yeah. attempts yeah. a game is perfectly respectable. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think they're having they're having a great day. They have landed a lot of guys. Of course, Marvin Wilson still out there. Well, I think um, you know we talk about Kojo being such a, a great recruiter, but I think what helps him also is that it's not your typical transition class for a new head coach because he's already been at LSU this whole time, and a lot of these relationships right. are relationships that he already has. So he's not coming in trying to piece something together very quickly at the last minute like a lot of first year head coaches are. Fair, fair. Um, I think we're going to do a little bit more in the social vein. We're winding up here, but do we have another social question to ask here? We do. It's from Connor McKinney. Auburn is probably going to finish with another top 10 class. Your thoughts on their signees? We haven't talked about Auburn in much depth today, so yeah, I'd be curious to think uh, what, you, what you both feel about how Gus did today. Maybe the most important signing in all of college football. Yeah. Jarrett Stidham. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Okay. Junior college quarterback, Auburn last year, did not have a quarterback to count on. Uh, White did not stay healthy. I mean, when he was in there, he was decent. But to get the former Baylor QB, who I, I think we all thought when he came out of Texas was one of the more talented guys we've seen at the quarterback position in a while, to get him in, to get him enrolled early, they beat out a number of top schools for him, uh, he might be worth like a, a, a win or two I mean, o- over what they did this year. To have not only competent quarterbacking, you know, backing, but potentially really good quarterback. And it... They also added a number of elite athletes as well. Um, Malcolm Askew is a, a very versatile guy. They got him in early. We already mentioned earlier in the show Calvin Ashley uh, out of, I guess we can call him out of Maryland now, but he's, yeah. he's been out a Florida guy forever. Four high school. Looked like he played in the NFL when he was like 16. Um, just yeah. huge. Tadarian Moultrie, you know, is a really, uh, he's a thumper at middle linebacker, a guy that, that likes to hit. He, he, he's like, I don't like to talk, I like to hit. And I, <laughs> I like hearing that from my linebackers, not as yes. an interviewer, but. Uh, you know, <laughs> and someone like football. Make a bad tape. You're right. Yeah, and then and then Marcavius Bryant, the defensive end, who they you know, we, we heard earlier, LSU thought they might get him, and uh, so did Georgia. And all of a sudden, here are the Tigers. Yeah, this is a top 10 class. The fact that we're like not talking about it that much is, is I guess, a great sign for Gus Malzahn quietly landing a top 10 class and. And indicative uh, of the SEC West is difficult, right? Four right. in the SEC, yeah. I mean, I, I do think Stidham is, you're absolutely right that Stidham, yeah. Stidham is the potential game changer. That also puts a lot of pressure, it feels like, on Auburn to turn it around mm-hmm. next year. I mean, overall, true. Auburn didn't have a terrible 2016. It, it had its bumps, but you looked at it at the end and you were like, yeah, they mostly lost the good teams that were better than they were, and they hung with almost all of them. But, you know, they got to play Clemson again next year. Uh, they got to go to LSU. They got to. They they still got to play Alabama. They got to play Georgia as always. Um, there's still there's still work to be done at Auburn, I think. And it's interesting to ask, sort of, what is the expectation going to be with Jared Stidham coming in? I mean, are, are reasonable people expecting him to overtake Alabama? I'm we're sure ta- Auburn we're fans talking are. talking about SEC fans, so no. I think they, they should at least expect to finish top three in that division, okay. right? Ole Miss is losing a good bit. Yeah. They, they lost Chad Kelly. Arkansas didn't seem to improve a whole lot this, this year. Mississippi State, I know they, they lose some. Um, you know, A&M, we'll see how, how much better they are. I, I think they need to be top three in that division with improved quarterback and play, and, and maybe the expectation should be number two. We'll see. Cool. That would be something. Um, all right, before we get going, there's obviously a lot of signing day left. We have a number of commits who have not yet announced. I asked Bud to make predictions for where they are going to go, if we can go ahead and see them here. And and please screenshot this wherever you are so that if Bud's wrong, you can talk to him about them. Uh, Bud, let's take these one by one. Uh, give us a little bit about each one of these guys and why you think they're going to pick the schools that you've chosen for them. Sure. Uh, Devontae Smith is one of your smoothest athletes in the country out of uh, Amite, Louisiana. Um, LSU was on him, but this is a recruitment that I know Jeremy Pruitt has been heavily involved in. Uh, Smith was you know, looking at Georgia back when Pruitt was there. Pruitt left Georgia to go to become Alabama's defensive coordinator. Kind of the same connection there. If, if you recall last year, Shaheem Carter uh, that, that Alabama pulled was a former UGA commit. Recruiting is all about relationships, and to get certain kids, you have to know certain people. And I think Alabama knows the right people uh, to be able to pull this kid out of the state of Louisiana. Um, good anecdote here. And look, he wants to say, "Hey, I like Florida State a lot. I like LSU a lot." I asked him, "Compare your game to a NFL receiver," and he said, "Julio Jones." And Julio Jones is probably three inches and 
40 pounds bigger th than Devontae Smith is. And I was like, well, how about another one? Just trying <laughs> to make a video here and maybe have him compare himself to somebody of yeah. reasonable similar size. Amari Cooper. <laughs> Both of whom played for Alabama. <laughs> so I was kind of like, huh, I feel like you like the Tide a little uh -huh. bit. This, uh -huh. is, this is curious. He also canceled his visit to Miami and instead spent the weekend, I believe, on an unofficial visit, which is on your own dime, in Tuscaloosa. So if this is not Alabama, I'm going to be pretty surprised. I mean, um, I think that's a vacation decision most of us have made in the past. You know, go to Tuscaloosa instead of South. I don't want to go to Miami. I right. Go, What's there? I'd rather Robert spend my own money. Trail, I'm sure. I'm going to spend my own money to go to Tuscaloosa. Absolutely. Um, uh, Greg, jo Greg yeah. Johnson, a uh, really athletic guy. I think he could play receiver. I think he could play safety. Um, look, a, a number of teams like him. I know Nebraska, that they want to do the Calabrasca thing where, yep. where, where they get the kids from Cali. I, I think this is going to be USC as well. USC, I think, has already pulled four four-stars today. Uh, they could finish with you know, two more blue chips here. As we also talk about Joseph Lewis. Joseph Lewis, who I think it, at one point was rated the number one receiver in the nation. Uh, I don't know where he finished, but still, I think, it, like a top five type level receiver. Great balance, good body control, good ball skills. He's a hands catcher. He does not let the ball get into his frame. I think he runs good routes and, and, and has good size. Is he the fastest or the biggest? No, but he's a really nice balance uh, of, of all those traits, and USC could certainly use him. I, I, I just don't think USC is going to lose a kid like this to Nebraska, even though they, they really want him there. We'll, we'll see if, uh, if he follows a couple other California kids who, who did end up committing uh, to the Cornhuskers. And then Marvin Wilson, a little something for your buddies back at Tomahawk Nation. Yeah, yeah, that would be a, a good, nice little capper for the traffic today if that, that happens. Um, <laughs> You know, Marvin Wilson's had a very interesting recruitment, and the reason is because how often are you pulling a five-star DT out of the state of Texas? Right. Well, Texas was down, A&M also down, Oklahoma's been on him, Ohio State's been on him, LSU's been on him, Florida State's been on him. I think if Charlie Strong had been kept and had a better season, he would be at Texas. Mm. He actually liked Charlie Strong so much that he scheduled an official visit to USF, mm. which you don't usually see five-star sure, yeah. tackles. Right. Um, so he didn't take that visit. But still, you know, that kind of shows you how much he liked Texas. Texas firing Charlie Strong opens the door legitimately for everybody else. He's got a great relationship with Ed Orgeron, right? Houston's only like four and a half hours away from Baton Rouge. Tallahassee, a reasonable car trip is about 12. We know he loves Odell Hagan's the D-tackle coach. We, we know he loves Tim Brewster, who's obviously recruited the, the Houston area before. Tim Brewster's the guy for Texas that got Vince Young to the University of Texas from Houston about, about a decade ago. I think this is an FSU-LSU battle. I know some Ohio State people were optimistic, but I, that's real far away. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I give FSU a slight edge here just because I think he's, he's been on campus enough times to, to make the difference. But if it's LSU, it wouldn't surprise me at all. Amy, how do you feel about Bud's – those four predictions, Bud? Do you take – you disagree with any of them? The only one that I'm going to disagree with is the LSU pick for, for Marvin Wilson. So, you know, splitting hairs here. Like you okay. said, he, you know, he's kind of – that one's kind of a toss-up for him. But um, I think it is interesting that the LSU defensive line coach did not do it in home visit with Marvin Wilson. But we talk about mom. Mom's a key piece of everyone's recruitment. Mm -hmm. I think – the closer to home, the better for her, and LSU would would be that option. Be significantly so. Yes. Fair enough. Um, before. But we he get... is having second thoughts, according to his Twitter, Mr. Hollywood. This is true. <laughs> Gosh. So what does that mean? Stupid Twitter. Everybody discuss. Twitter. Also, I'm, not, I'm not a big fan of 4:35 Eastern time commitment announcements. Let's, let's get all these knocked out, like I either know. during lunch break at school or before we go to school. You sound like Felder. Uh, yeah. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh my word. <clears throat> um, couple things before we wrap up here. First, if you haven't seen it yet, I honestly don't <coughs> know how. Um, Illinois State today signed an offensive lineman by the name of Kobe Buffalo Meat. That's one word, Buffalo Meat. This kid is a future star. A I love NFL career. I am probably inviting him to the Piesman no matter what. I'm so excited. There's all kinds of jokes you can make here with like the word grind or steak uh -huh, or uh -huh. I mean, just. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. The references are endless. Yeah, he needs to go to the Piesman as like he, he could win the high school Piesman. He's he's a coll he's going to be a collegiate player now, so he has yeah. to win Illinois the Piesman. Illinois State's, State's eligible. Do Illinois you buy an underclassman? Anybody can make it. Yeah. Perfect. Oh yeah, we don't we don't have. Standards. He's just an automatic invite, no matter what. He, when he but registered we, it this year, it's fine. Yeah, but, invite him. but we hate cookies on air. What makes you Buffalo think we have these lofty <laughs> standards? Are you kidding me? Um, we also want to talk real briefly about how. Maybe one day National Signing Day is not a thing anymore, at least not the one we're talking about here on February 1st. There's 
to me, this feels very much like um, conference expansion or the college football playoff, the kind of thing that we talk mm -hmm. about over and over and over again. And if it happens, it's just going to happen like that. There's not going to be like a lot of prolonged dialogue. They're, the powers that be will just say, now there is an early <laughs> signing day. Um, people have all kinds of opinions about this. I would like to know what you guys think about potentially adding an earlier signing day. I will, college football. You know, what are we, what's the idea here? Too much of a, of a good thing? Like, right. what's better than one national signing day? Right. Three right. national right. signing days. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I, I personally am not a fan of the idea simply because I think uh, I'm always going to defend the kids. I'm always going to want it to be more, to advantage more flexible for the them. children. Yeah. yeah, and I think that if coaches get fired or if there's turnover there, I think kids uh, have more of a chance of getting, uh, you know, stuck there if, if they are signing Not early. Anywhere. I will say, though, the one improvement that I want to see, we're talking about an early signing period and there's all these conferences and meetings to discuss and vote. I want to get rid of the fax machine. That would be my first order of business. <laughs> Come up with a better way to do an LOI. Uh -huh. That to me is more important than an early signing period. I, I, assume, you... <laughs> I assume college football would have learned from the NFL when I think it was Elmas Domerville uh, <laughs> unsuccessfully <laughs> signed with the team because the fax came too late oh. and then <laughs> they're going somewhere else. I so like, yep. if that didn't teach you the lesson. Uh, Bud, what do you think about it? You know, it looks like the proposed date is going to be sometime in early December, yep. which is oftentimes when junior college kids and early enrollees sign. And I, I guess that'd be okay. But I have a couple questions. One, under what circumstances can you be let out of your letter of intent, yes. right? If a coach gets fired, okay, should you be let out? If it's a head coach, I think we'd all agree that's pretty obvious. Right. Maybe it should be, I think, a, a, a two-pronged system here. It's a head coach, sure. And then you get to pick two coaches, your future position coach. If he gets let go, you can get out. And then also your area recruiter, like the guy that, that comes to your town and recruits you. I think if they've implemented that system where if one of these three coaches gets let go. You have an out. Correct. Or maybe your coordinator, maybe that'd be four. Right. But it, not just any random coach because then you'd have your kid be like, actually, now I want to go here now. Right. Then it's a loophole more than a right. meaningful way of responding to your needs. I'd like to see that sort of restriction put on it. And then we move this thing to Labor Day. Because that way, all these kids can play their high school football seasons at the ones that have already, you know, ac academically they're on track, yep. and they have already visited the schools. We're gonna move up the official visit calendar so these kids can visit some of these schools on the school's dime over summer, and they can play their senior seasons without worrying about if I get hurt, am I gonna lose my offer? Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they're already be locked in, or they can say, hey, I can really focus strong. It's it's a good incentive to finish out and get my grades, get them right because I've already I've already committed. As opposed to you know taking all these visits, I, I I think that would be better. But as it is now, I'm, I'm sure it'll be a, a a mess for a year or two. Um, we had Richard Johnson, I know, has talked to some coaches about this particular issue. I think we have a quote from one coach. Yes, he talked to Doug Martin at New Mexico State. He points out that every other sport does this. This is a thing I think yeah. college football fans forget a lot that every other college uh, college sport does this. Basketball has had early signing day for a long, long time. So. I think that hopefully if college football does this, they can at least learn from early signing day as it exists in the other sports and avoid some of the pitfalls yeah, that you guys are talking about. maybe not reinvent the wheel. That would be yeah. ideal. I don't know that they're necessarily going to do that. Do we have so to make sense? I guess we're <laughs> totally screwing this up. Um, as you, media, I'm extremely for four <laughs> signing days, by the way. That yeah. is, that, that's good. How do you think coaches as a whole feel about this? <laughs> Just talking to them, they were not happy at all about the proposed uh, June date. They yeah. thought that was way too early, right. and that, that got shot down, I believe, at the coaches' convention, yes. and the compromise date looks to be December. I, I think most of them are going to be cool with December. Uh, now, what week you put it on in December I also think matters because some coaches get fired like second week in December, yeah. right? Yes. If you put it first week in December, that's going to create a lot of – Hey, man, you, you were my coach last week, but this week you're not switched. Right. If you put it like December 18th, a week from Christmas, most coaches are, are either fired or retained by that date. I think that would cut down on sort of the shenanigans like that. Yeah, it's it would be really interesting to see how adding a signing day would impact the hire. Because recruiting always comes into your decisions about whether you're going to cut a coach loose or not. But if you add an earlier signing day, now your decision has to get moved up a lot earlier and... Unlike, you know, a lot of other sports, you have so much less data to work with. I mean, we saw LSU did this this year, bailed on less miles pretty early, but that was also based on a whole nother year. Right. And I think it would be, I always like anything that puts athletic directors' feet to the fire, just because I'm a cruel and mean person. 
But the idea that you could have to say, yeah, we have to fish or cut bait on this guy in October, or else we're going to be screwed when it comes to this early signing day, oh, that's delightful. Yeah. But I'm a mean person, so. I mean, athletic directors are getting paid a lot of money. I think it's okay. I think it's okay. That's true. And so things get a little stressful sometimes for them. I don't feel bad about it. It's fine. I think the only one I ever feel bad for is it's Vanderbilt, who the athletic director is also like a law professor and two other. He has (laughs) like four jobs. jobs. It's. I think he also has to do like work the maintenance plant or something. It's terrible. (laughs) Um, Any other final thoughts you guys have about? This signing day, signing day in general, again, we didn't get any questions about Bud Skin Regimen, but we're happy to answer them. Um, yeah, anything you guys want to say before we go? I think the top heaviness of this year is noteworthy, <laughs> right? We, we already mentioned Ohio State's class will be number one in several other years. Georgia's class, I think, would be number two in a lot of other years and potentially number one in, in a couple select years. But the, the, the top three, the top six, seven, Man, that is a really top-heavy class. I think if you went and added it up and said, look look how many four- and five-stars the, you know, the top six signed this year, I yeah. think what we're going to find is that it's a lot more than a given year. So it's very top-heavy. It's not as balanced. The drop-off is more significant. So if you're not in that group, you're going to feel it is what I'm hearing. Unless you – I mean, it's just one year, though. Yes, that's that's yeah. what we should leave people yes. with. If you had a bad year, that does not mean you're going to have a bad roster. You had a bad year. Your roster is comprised of four years of recruiting. Right. If you had a great year, it doesn't mean – you're going to be a good team all of a sudden. You, it's consistency. It's 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 stacking five stars on top of five stars, having them compete, having them go. You know, you, you want that that one five star, your sophomore five star, to be pressed by your freshman five star because that's why you get more high quality reps in practice. You get better competition. It, one year does not make or, make or break a, a school. Fair. Amy, anything else? Um, honestly, I'm I'm very distracted because Beyonce just announced she's pregnant with twins. So. <laughs> Uh, we'll be talking about a crazy that's, signing day, and I'm like, yeah. oh, Beyonce's having twins? What is this? Um, there's, yes, yeah, speaking of major announcements, <laughs> uh, I don't know why Beyonce has to upstage us here at that's, SB no, Nation that's today, completely but, Beyonce. Yes, yeah. I know. She's always, it's always something. Um, yeah, just watching some of the commitments come in. Jemias Williams sticking with South Carolina. Um, I think that's huge for Will Muschamp. I, he's one of my favorite players in this class. Obviously not the, the highest rated kid, but um, a guy who really, really impressed me at the opening when he um, was always taking the extra five minutes um, when everyone's lacing up their shoes and warming up to put in his headphones and work on his back pedal and work on different stuff um, when everybody else is, you know, on their Instagram or yeah, whatever. Right, so right. Um, just a, a big a big get for Will Muschamp there with that one. Yeah. We worry about measurables so much. And, look, they, they do matter. But at a certain point, the kids have, have proved that they can play at, at a certain level. Like LaMarcus Joyner was never going to get taller, but he looked, not, he looked very much like, like he belonged with elite players. Something to consider, too, as far as market efficiency, right? There are certain schools, Alabama, Ohio State, who can say, guess what? We're not going to take a corner who, who's 5'9". Five, five but there are some schools that are so focused on measurables and they really kind of, they're reaching a little too much. Right. There are good players who are a little bit smaller that if you're a South Carolina, I think that they've done a great job. Chris Lamont's a couple of years ago, yep. right? You have to identify who you are as a school. And if you're South Carolina, take a Jemias Williams and say, yeah, he may be 5'9", but he can ball. Mm-hmm. And, and I'd rather have a 5'9 kid who can ball rather than a 6'1 six foot, six foot kid who looks good in shoulder pads but, but can't turn his hips. Mm-hmm. So you got to understand who you are as a school. I think it's really important <coughs> to identify that uh, and, and to offer the right kids. I think South Carolina did that on the defensive side of the ball this year. Nice. Um, that's all we've got for this year. Signing, recruiting literally Ryan, never stops. how are you feeling about Florida? I don't want it. I, I'm more excited for Beyonce, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Me too. You know? Florida so with that. the top 15. As, Congrat- as here now. Congratulations to Beyonce and to your team because yeah. your team did great and your rival sucks. And that's what we will always <laughs> believe here at SB Nation. Uh, that's all we have for Amy and Bud. I am Ryan. Continue to tweet Bud at SBN Recruiting and we'll see you before you know it. Again, this never ends.